to some <laughs> we have three board members physically on the dais here today we have uh myself board vice president lieberman board member smith are physically here on the dais uh on joining us virtually our board members Coleman, Leon Vasquez, Tavilder and Jesswin, and Foster. So all seven board members are present for the meeting. Um, I will ask everybody to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your hand over your heart. Stay with us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Public and with its stand, one to God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Wonderful. I've got a few items to report out, read out from closed session. So bear with me while I do this, please. Um, DN 1012 2122, final settlement agreement. Kindly note that the summary of the settlement is as follows The district agrees to reimburse parents in an amount not to exceed $30,000 for students' privately funded related services. The district agrees to pay reasonable attorney fees. In the amount of $8,100, motion by board member Leah Vasquez, seconded by board member Foster, approved 7 0. DN 1013 2122, final settlement agreement. Kindly note that the summary of the settlement is as follows The district agrees to reimburse parents in an amount not to exceed $27,250 for students' educational services. The district agrees to pay reasonable attorney fees in the amount of $3,000, motion made by board member Smith. Seconded by board member Leon Vasquez, approved 7 0. DN 10 14 21 22, final settlement agreement. Um, kindly note that the summary of the settlement is as follows The district agrees to reimburse parents in an amount not to exceed $77,500 for students' educational services. Motion by board member Smith, seconded by board member Foster. Six board members in favor, uh, uh, Board President Keene, myself, abstain from that vote. Uh, DN 1015 2122, final settlement agreement. Kindly note that the summary of the settlement is as follows The district agrees to reimburse parents in an amount not to exceed $40,000 for the 21 22 school year and $40,000 for the 22 23 school year for educational costs incurred during the 21 22 and 22 23 school years, inclusive of the extended school years. Motion by board member Foster, seconded by board member Coleman, approved with a 7 0 vote. That is all I have to report out. Uh, we are now moved to approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as submitted? Oh, I've said so. Thank you for catching me. Remind me the, 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 the number, please. Okay. Um, sorry, we are, um, I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve the agenda with one addition. We are adding an item F4 under major action items which is the addition of an additional uh, of a custodial contract uh, that will be explained when we get to major action items. So do I have a motion to approve the agenda? That, that's posted on the agenda at this point, That is right? on the, that's that on the online agenda, correct. Yes, so do I have a move by Maria, seconded by Lori. I will do a roll call, Jennifer. Yes. Lori. Yes. Keith. That's a thumbs up, Maria. Yes. Richard. Richard, are you with us or are you frozen out? Craig? Craig, are you with us? I think Richard was frozen. Richard, approval of the agenda with the one, uh, the one addition, uh, additional item, F4. Thumbs up. Is Craig, are you back? Did you just disappear? Craig Foster? So Craig must have stepped away. Uh, uh, board member Castanaza. Nathan? Yes. Thumbs up. And, and remind me, Phil, what's his last name? I'm here, John. Oh, Craig, approve. Okay, um, Craig, you approval of the agenda? Thumbs up. Felix, help me one time with the pro proper pronunciation of your last name, board member from Malibu. Uh, Deraspe Drosh. Deraspe, okay. Thank you. Are you in favor of approving the agenda with this one addition? Yes. Thank you. And I'm in favor of the agenda. So the agenda is approved with that one addition. Brings us to approval of minutes from October 7. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? By Keith, uh, by, by board member Foster, seconded by board member Leon Vasquez. Uh, any corrections or comments on the minutes? I know we have no public comments. I didn't see any. 
So I will ask for a roll call vote to approve the minutes. Maria? Oh, I waited until you took a bite. Yes. That was very nice of me. Yes. Uh, Felix? Yes. Felix with us? Yes. Great. Nathan? Yes. Keith? Richard? Craig? Yes. 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 Did I get to you already? Yes. Lori? Yes. And I'm a yes. So the minutes are now approved, which brings us to superintendent's report, Dr. Drotty. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so for today, I, uh, uh, in my superintendent's report, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Carrie Upton to show us, uh, show you and the community a demonstration of how uh, our contracts are organized into a depository so people can look at. Uh, I know that's been an interest of the board for us to create. So uh, thank you to Gail Penster and Carrie Upton for organizing that. So because FIP has the most uh, um, amount of contracts that are, that are the biggest, I'll have Carrie showcase how that's gonna look. So Carrie Upton, would you uh, take over? Certainly, I'll be happy to. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm presenting it, but I will say it was uh, Gail, uh, and Marianne Solomon, our uh, webmaster, and Kathy Stabe, our administrative assistant in FIP, and Sheree uh, Bishop, uh, who's our procurement director in FIP, who really put this all together, but I just get to show it off. So I'm going to uh, share my screen for just a moment. Uh, I'm going to the uh, online agenda, uh, and I will just go to this first item right here, which is the agreement, uh, award of agreement for Grant Elementary School HVAC project, technology move management services with direct source communications. It's just the first one on the list, but if you page down to the uh, bottom of this, you'll find the thing that says supporting links. And if you click on where it says backup documents and go to there, then I'm actually gonna shift to a more easier page. You'll see all of the documents that are in support of uh, on the agenda this time. Now, as they get worked through, you know, in the folders, we have more information and everything. But if you go down to a word of agreement for grant, eventually we will add the numbers for the agenda items. We just didn't, haven't gotten that yet, but we'll turn that around so that those will be here. Uh, and you go to this one, which is the award of the agreement. This right here is the proposal that we received from direct source and what we're using as our basis of award. So it has all of the information. This is a uh, technology move management where they are moving uh, materials as part of the, uh, the, 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 the modernization HVAC project that's happening at Grant. All of the details are currently here and with, along with the price and the text and who it is, all that we're doing. From this, after you approve it tonight, we will go back and we will create an agreement. And with that, um, and from that agreement, let me change this a moment, from that agreement, we will be able to, uh, we'll post the agreement once it's done and once it's fully executed. Uh, we do have our standard agreements, which are, which are on the FIP webpage. Um, I can hope, hopefully pull that up pretty quickly for you as you follow along. Can you still see my screen or as I'm moving along? Yes, we have it. Okay, great, good. Uh, I'm gonna go to the FIP page. Um, facility improvements. And about us project list and source, this is where Carrie is, oh, under procurement, sorry. Um, professional services, uh, bidding archives, contractor bidding, uh, bidding archives. And under here, I believe we're putting the uh, contracts, but I'm not fully sure that where they are. Uh, but it does say what we're bidding on and uh, what the contract, what our normal contracts are, formal contracts, everything that's sort of here for those things. So you'll be able to see that. I'll make sure that it's a little more clear than uh, what I'm finding at the moment. Uh, but that will allow you to see and track our basic contracts and the information that gets filled into them is the information that is on the backup documents. And that should provide some information. We're the first ones doing this, the first board meeting that we really have sort of put it in place. We're going to get better at it as we figure it out uh, and get clearer, but that will provide you backup information for all of our board items. Are there any questions? Um. Not yet. I think I think we are going to have to play with this for a little bit to find out uh, what we want to do. But thank you so much. I think this is a, a great response to something that our public has asked for. Uh, it provides 
nothing but transparency. So thank you for, for the hard work to get this put together. And I know it is a work in progress and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep amending as we learn, as we learn. So thank you, Carrie. Appreciate that. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. And uh, this is one more item. Yeah. So the last uh, reporting is this uh, uh, to report out that we had our great shakeout uh, emergency drill today. And uh, normally uh, uh, the district office works in concert with the sites uh, because uh, uh, from here at the district office, we practice what we would do to district office in supporting the sites. And then the sites also held their incidents command as they practice their drill. So it went, it went smoothly. It's good to do these things, uh, like I said, every year because you get new staff members that have different roles and uh, uh, going through these kind of exercises actually helps us with, with how we deal with emergencies. And in this place in Santa Monica, Malibu, we, we have dealt with emergencies almost every year, whether it be the Woolsey fires, the mudslides, the uh, norovirus, you know, and the coronavirus and so on. But uh, great job to all the staff members that participated in this. And thank you to all the uh, sites as well in their participation. Great, thanks, Dr. Trotty. I uh, appreciate that. So that concludes the superintendent's report. It brings me now to consent. Um, do I have a motion to approve consent as submitted? Anyone, Jennifer? Moved by Jennifer Smith, seconded by Richard Builder and Jessman. Uh, I, there are no public comments on consent. So I will say, does anybody have anything they need to add or say? And I will ask for a roll call. Jennifer. Yes. Lori. Yes. Maria. Yes. Keith. Yes. Uh, Nathan. Yes. Richard is his hand up, but yes. Felix. Yes. Craig. Yes. And I am a yes. So consent is passed. Wonderful. So now we're going to try to, we have, a, we have our timestamp item at seven, which is the, the bulk of our meeting, but we do have some major action items to deal with before that. So the first one is F1, adopt resolution number 2108, proclaiming a local emergency, ratifying the proclamation of a state of emergency by Governor Newsom dated March 4, 2020, and authorizing remote teleconference meetings for the period of November 1, 2021 through November 30, 2021. Remember, this came about um, as part of SB that I'm forgetting, SB 3, 361, uh, which has to be approved every month that allows us to continue meeting uh, in this sort of uh, manner that we're meeting in right now. So I will ask for a motion to approve the resolution. Make a motion. Moved by Jennifer, seconded by Maria. I will then say we have uh, five multiple five comments. public comments, so we will hear from the members of the public. Uh, we have, oh, sorry, put that list back up. We have five public comments on this item. Uh, each person will have up to three minutes. First three speakers are Wade Major, followed by uh, Angela Di Gaetano, and then Chevy Baruch. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, all right. There is no local emergency. There is no state emergency. There is, however, as has been widely reported this week, an enrollment emergency and a funding emergency. 24 states have ended their state of emergency. Another 19 are expected to expire in the next three months. California is one of only seven states with an open-ended state of emergency. And this is what the data looks like. This is LA County in cases and deaths, starting at the beginning of the state of emergency, ending, starting, ending. We are no longer at a state of emergency. This is also what the county looks like. We are in the least threatened part of the county. Our numbers are still non-existent. And this is what the data looks like in the county. This is where cases are. This is where deaths are. This is where hospitalizations are. The data nationwide, statewide, and countywide does not support a state of emergency. It is irresponsible to even pretend that there is one. 
If you have district information to the contrary, please pass a resolution so that you declare it to the parents first before you make any such resolution declaring a state of emergency. Angela D. Gaetano, followed by Chevy Baruch, and then Blair Ivan Miller. Angela, uh, are you logged on video under one and audio under a different name? Thumbs up if that's correct. If that's not her, then okay. Can we go to Chevy Baruch and then Blair Ivan Miller and then Annika Evans? And if you can find Angela Di Gaetano in the meantime. Hi, I just wanted to say that I think that it's time that we will have the transparency of the consent, the content. We are being given consent when we were forced to give consent. And I know that everybody are very worried about all kinds of things, but we never have been asked if this is what we want to do. Nobody really sent us something that says what the parents wants to do. And I wanted to say that it's enough for the state of emergency. There's no emergency anymore. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Sarah, was I hearing you say you have found somebody or? Oh, okay. Blair, Ivan Miller, and then Annika Evans. You just need to make sure that your um, Zoom profile name matches the name you signed up with on public comment. Okay, let's go to her. Go ahead, Annika. Hello. Hello. You can hear me? We, hear you. we can okay, hear you. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to say that the, the state of emergency is, is over with. There's not enough cases anymore proving that it even needs to be in effect. When it comes to the COVID testing, there's a really low percentage is even for California and Santa Monica right now a percentage of even active cases and the cases that are, they are not even threatening in any way. They're just like a common cold. There is absolutely no reason for this to continue. Why should they have to continue wearing masks? Why should we continue testing? And I do not you know, want the vaccine to be mandated when especially for the children as they don't even get sick. This is over with. This should not even be having this discussion right now because this is just a joke. Uh, this is outrageous that it's even up on the table in, for discussion. This is over with. You know, you look at the numbers, you know, please follow the numbers. Just don't do as you please. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Angela Di Gaetano. Hi, sorry about that earlier. Um, okay. I would like, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so I really think that um, this sort of cloak of state of emergency is being used as an excuse to commit um, Brown Act violations as everybody on the board is 
aware um, there is a group of us that's getting larger by the day that is noticing multiple Brown Act violations done by this board and it continues to do so. Um, they're unlawful and they seem to be an attempt to cheat the public from having any opportunity to comment on the agenda and be educated about the agenda. Um, we are not in a state of emergency and everybody knows that the COVID numbers are minuscule and they're being used as an attempt to lock parents from information and from choice. And I just wanna make it clear that these violations are noticed and we are catching them and uh, we will be raising an issue about them. So please understand that um, the COVID cloak needs to end, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah, were you able to find Blair Ivan Miller? Yeah. Okay, then that concludes the comments on this item. Terrific, do I have any board member comments or questions for this resolution? Okay, seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Lori? Yes. Uh, board member DeRaspeed Ross? Yes. Board member Castanaza? Yes. Board member Coleman? Yes. Board member Leon Vasquez? Yes. Board member Foster? Yes. Board member Tavilder and Jesswin? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that resolution passes, which brings us to major action item F2. Adopt emergency resolution arising from coronavirus and variants of COVID-19 and delegating authority to enter into contracts necessitated by COVID-19 for safety procurements. Um, this is a, a resolution that we had in place that we let expire. And now it has come to our attention that there are certain items that are coming up that would fall under this, like uh, custodial support and other, other things of that nature. So that's why this resolution has come back to us so that we're not falling behind on certain things that can be easily addressed. Um, why don't I ask for a, a motion and a second and then we can take any clarifying questions or support that people need. Mo moved by Maria, seconded by Keith. Um, we have public comment, so let's get to public comment and then we'll do, actually, no, clarifying questions first because that could help our members of the public. Anything clarifying from the board for this? Carrie is here to explain this if we'd like him to. So why don't I just do that as a clarifying question? Cl Carrie, Clary, can you clarify? Cl Carrie, can you clarify uh, why this resolution is coming back to us? Absolutely, we were uh, uh, very pleased in July to be able to sunset uh, this uh, measure. Uh, but what we have found is there in a, just one or two places we are uh, to meet our COVID uh, requirements uh, that are put forth by our uh, Department of Health. Uh, we, we are just having some challenges where we need the um, ability to short term some of our procurement that allows us to uh, get some of these things. One of those things uh, is uh, the purchasing of quick test kits that are needed particularly for our athletics. And another thing is for uh, some custodial support because uh, we're, and I will explain that more with the next measure, but uh, this one really does, uh, uh, we're gonna use it in a very limited fashion. And as with the previous emergency, uh, uh, resolution, we will come back to the board at every major meeting uh, and ask for you to renew it with a four-fifths vote. Uh, and we will and we will report on what we've used this what we've used this resolution to purchase. Uh, and we will look forward to sunsetting this one uh, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you for clarifying that, Carrie. Uh, let's go to our public comments and then we can have any board member comments or discussion on this item. There are seven public comments on this. Um, the first three uh, names are Wade Major, followed by Jane, no, I'm sorry, uh, Melissa Solano, and then Jane Rainsford. Am I on? Yes, you are. All right. So once again, there is no emergency. It's over. So passing another emergency resolution for a non-existent emergency so you can delegate power to enter into contracts without board approval is again unprecedented as it was last time. And it smells like an end run around transparency as well as a blank check for possible corruption and conflict of interest. Don't do this, especially when we're talking about medical agreements that implicate HIPAA, our children's data privacy, parental rights, and irreversible impacts on their health. This is literally passing a resolution once again to evade doing a core part of your jobs. 
we understand that Dr. Drati is accountable to the board and the board is accountable to political backers like SMRR, Local 11 and Santa Monica Forward, as well as the Santa Monica City Council. We understand that's your real constituency, not kids or families, but we bear the brunt of your actions. This is why a lot of people watching tonight fully intend to take your jobs. So we respectfully ask that you demonstrate political independence, do right by the families you are sworn to serve, and not pass any resolution related to recognizing an emergency, no matter the damage it does to your political aspirations. Thank you. Melissa Solano, Jane Rainsford, and then Chevy Baruch. <clears throat> I come to you again tonight because I'm against a board overstepping their job titles and taking a stance as if they held a doctorate in medicine. You don't hold a doctorate in medicine. The board has never approved a policy that allows staff to enter into an agreement with the provider without first receiving approval from the board in a public meeting. We don't disagree that there are other resolutions, but we don't agree that there is one that deals with medical providers and medical agreements. The complications of HIPAA, children's medical data, DNA, and PII data needs to be seriously taken into account. You guys have to stop this. We are not in a state of an emergency. Everybody knows this, everybody's saying this. And there are other things that I will address later on during general comments, because if you truly cared about the kids, especially the kids in Malibu, you wouldn't have denied our request to enter back into SMEF. So we'll discuss that later, but please think about that and think about what you're doing. Uh, thank you, Jane Rainsford, and I'm sorry, is that? Yes. Um, Chevy Baruch and then Angela Di Gaetano. Hello, thank you. Um, my concerns are that the board has never ex approved a policy that allows staff to enter into an agreement with a provider without first receiving approval from the board in a public meeting like this. This allows for the all needed transparency, especially when we are dealing with medical providers. I don't disagree that there are other resolutions, but I don't agree that there is one that deals with medical providers and medical agreements. The complications and the essential laws of HIPAA, our children's medical data, their DNA and PII, personal identifiable information, needs to be seriously taken into account and gravely considered. For example, as parents, we don't know how long the contracts of PCR testing with Malibu Medical and Dr. Now are for. Are they indefinitely? Are they until December the 2nd when the CDC is withdrawing all the PCR tests? The public needs to witness the transparency around how long the contracts are gonna be signed for, any adjustments you may make to privacy agreements or third party data sharing, especially when it comes to medical providers and our children's medical data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chevy Baruch, Angela Di Gaetano, and Annika Evans. Hi. Um, I wanted to speak about the fact that the core issue that we have here is the fact that we're talking about all kinds of ways to protect the kids and the staff, when we really need to think about two things. And, and everybody else spoke about the fact that we really don't have that much COVID-19 uh, cases. So the chance is like to have um, one to what, 10,000 people that could be positive. That makes absolutely no sense when you think about the size of this uh, um, district. And then the other thing is, the problem is that we have nature and we are trying to control nature right now. And it makes absolutely no sense to continue checking healthy kids over and over and over again with a temperature check, with the, the apps that are now completely insane, that it says the status of the vaccination on it, and now we need to show it to everyone, which is, by the way, illegal. And then on top of that, we're doing testing weekly and getting zero cases and zero cases and zero cases. When are we going to get the email that says no more? We don't need to prove everybody is healthy anymore and stop really abusing those kids. Because I'll tell you, I have a little girl, she's 10, and she tells me every week, 
you needed to see the little one from the preschool next to me crying, crying, crying when they do the testing for them. And her heart is breaking. And my heart is breaking. Because nobody tells you about those things. But why are kids need to be abused like that to be proven that they're healthy? That's it. Thank you. Uh, Annika Evans, I'm sorry, Angela D. Gaetano, then Annika Evans, and then Maria Loya. Hi, um, thanks for letting me talk again. I just wanted to um, ditto everything everybody said. It's heart-wrenching to hear these stories. And um, there are so many stories that people can tell about young children having the impact of waking up every day being treated like they're ill when they're perfectly healthy. Um, it needs to end. Uh, the state of emergency is over. We all know that. The uh, prominent variant that is flying around, which is basically non-existent here, is the Delta variant, and the vaccine does not even prevent the Delta variant, as stated on the CDC website. So I guess my last thing to ask is, you know, maybe um, your definition of emergency is different than um, Webster's Dictionary or, um, you know, popular culture, in which case it would be really helpful if you could uh, give us some guidelines and perhaps some data on what um, emergency means to the board. Um, we implore you to hear us and to understand how damaging this is to our kids, um, particularly the young ones. It just breaks my heart. Um, I really believe that the board needs to dig deep and think about um, these decisions and parents need to be heard. So um, I beg of you to do that tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Annika Evans and then Maria Loya. And those will conclude our public comments on this item. Hi, yeah, once again, I really believe that uh, you guys need to really start listening to what the parents are saying um, and think about that there's other agendas and just yours. Just the matter of you know, everything that's going on right now, the masks, what do you know about the long term of that? You know, what happens if you actually deprive them of oxygen for these many hours every day? And I also needed to think about that when it comes to the vaccines, they are not FDA approved. It's still a test and you are encouraging kids to take uh, medical treatment tests. This is absolutely outrageous. And, um, you know, and the principals and teachers going around at school promoting this, like they were some doctors or something, that's not their place to go around and talk to this. I've been fine hearing about it over and over again already since last year, teachers talking about this, how everybody's going to be safe in the vaccine camp. Who knows if they're going to be safe? What's going to happen in 10 years after they take this? And uh, there's more people right now getting sick from COVID that's already vaccinated. And the kids uh, or the people that have not been vaccinated, that we don't see them down with COVID sick. So I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why you keep following and playing along with all these rules that should not even be in place right now. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Maria Loya, you'll be our last speaker. Good evening. Um, I primarily want to raise concern with the uh, implementation, the adoption and the implementation of the COVID surveillance program. Uh, parents uh, were being um, required to give consent um, that included uh, giving up the privacy of their children um, and in order for them in order for their children to uh, continue to go to school. However, the contracts had not been finalized. And so it's been a little confusing to me in terms of what, uh, which is the finalized um, contract. The other thing that concerns me is the security of, of the data that's being collected from our, of our children, including our children's DNA. It's not clear how they're going to dispose of our children's DNA. Uh, how are they protecting it in the contract that was shown to us, uh, that was on online? Um, 
in terms of the secure uh, cybersecurity, there were no check marks that um, there were no boxes that were check marked, which tells me there really isn't a plan in place to protect our children's DNA and our children's data. Right? Uh, we have been asked to give consent to um, have the school and these medical vendors have access to our children's medical records. However, it's not clear to how us how that's going to be protected. Uh, if you could please uh, respond to that, uh, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that is uh, the conclusion of public comment on that. So Carrie, just, I know you're still there, just for clarity. Um, the, the items that you described under this, that would fall under this resolution, you described the, the purchasing of rapid tests for athletic events and custodial services. There was nothing here that, that, that dealt with, say, our contracts on weekly testing or things of that nature. Those have come to the board. This is for, can you just give me clarity on that, please? Yeah, the only two things that currently are in discussion uh, is the purchase of the rapid test, as you said, that are used predominantly for uh, athletics and also for the uh, custodial staff support. Uh, those are the only two things we're currently discussing. And of course, we would bring anything back to you also if we had to move forward with this on the emergency resolution. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, are there any board member questions for, for Carrie or for anybody else on staff? We already have a motion and a second. Yes, Richard. I just wanna say I appreciate uh, Carrie's clarification there. Thank you, John, for bringing it back in to, to share that. Thank you, Richard. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, I'll ask for a roll call. Maria? Yes. Keith? Yes. Richard? Yes. Craig? Yes. Nathan? Yes. Felix? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Lori? Yes. And I'm a yes. So that resolution has been adopted. Major item F3, approve supplemental procedures to procure contractor services under the emergency resolution delegating authority to enter into contracts necessitated by COVID-19 safety operations. Uh, Carrie, would you like to provide clarity on this as well? Oh yes, I would. Uh, so this is a, an, a supplemental procedure that goes with the emergency regu regulate resolution that you just passed. Uh, what our challenge is, is, is that to meet the uh, requirements of the Los Angeles County Department of Health uh, COVID uh, reopening protocols, which are very, very extensive and include a lot of aspects of cleaning. And many of those I've listed here on the resolution uh, that expand our need for additional custodians by about 32 uh, people uh, beyond the 80 plus custodians that we usually have to meet all of these requirements. And the difficulty we're having is, uh, and we discussed this with y'all uh, last spring, uh, and it continues, is that we just can't get enough custodians. Uh, we have uh, some openings that we're filling. We have, uh, we're working our regular custodians in overtime assignments as much as possible that we're concerned about burning them out and us having some of them go down with uh, work injuries. Um, we are working people uh, out of class uh, as custodians. We have tried, we have dredged and completely gotten our complete sub pool to use as many of the subs as we have. And also um, our personnel commission has, <coughs> excuse me, um, run constant recruitments. Uh, and, you know, we had 40 potential people that we were, that we interviewed last week. Uh, and we have uh, maybe right now, we think we're gonna get eight out of that uh, recruitment, uh, but we're really down trying to, trying to make this work. So we uh, really feel the solution is to uh, do contracted services uh, and bring in custodians just to support the um, additional need. Um, this is very, very specific to support the additional need of the COVID protocols. So we will not use contracted services as soon as either we can get enough subs or enough permanent people that we can hire through the personnel commission 
or the reopening protocols change that we no longer need the additional 30 some odd assignments from our usual use of cleaning. But during this time, we really have to remain clean. So we had this conversation with the union. Um, they were uh, initially reluctant uh, to do this, but did work with us, especially because it is an emergency and it's done as an emergency resolution. Uh, and one of the things we've worked out with them is so the people we are getting, uh, which we'll discuss in the next action, the allied uh, custodial, uh, sorry, allied uh, janitor services is a union contractor. Uh, so we would be bringing in union folks. This is not intended in any way to replace the people that we have. Uh, they would not be in the rotation for overtime or anything like that. They'd be used just to supplement and make sure that we can get this work done. All of the people we will be, we will be bringing in will be fingerprinted and also will have to verify their vaccination status. Uh, so we are working to do this. Uh, we think we'll use about 15 people uh, a day, um, though we've asked for uh, authorization to go up to 20. Uh, what we're also covering is we've seen a number of absences uh, and people who are ill or out for whatever reason, and we've had to cover a number of those positions. So we're not having any subs to cover it. It means that, you know, on a day you might have like at Edison Elementary School, I think last night we had no custodians who were there in the evening to clean, and we only had one sub that we could move over there to clean. So that campus isn't getting fully cleaned the way it's supposed to. So this is the solution to that. Um, we will bring this back to you uh, with the emergency resolution every major meeting, uh, regular meeting, and then uh, we hope to sunset this as soon as possible. But this contract right now that we're going to be bringing to you is from now until uh, winter break uh, is, is our first start off, but we can cut it off at any point or we can reduce it down from the 20 to 15 to five as much as we need to as we can and as, as, thing, as our conditions change. But right now we do ask that you approve this um, so that we can actually make sure our schools are clean and we're meeting our reopening protocols as required by the LA County Department of Health. Great, thank you, Carrie. Are there any other clarifying questions from any board members? Okay, we have three public comments. I will um, respectfully ask the members of our public commenting on this to please keep their comments to pertain to this particular item uh, when you share your comments with the board on this item. Thank you. We have three commenters, Chevy Baruch, Annika Evans, and Chris Mock. Hi, I just wanted to say something very short. Um, I understand that there is a need for more people cleaning. I just don't understand the need for more people cleaning when we are not in a state of emergency and there's no, um, there's no cases in the schools and there are barely any cases in the Los Angeles County. So when are we going to wake up and make those decisions on something relevant instead of things that are not relevant? That's all. Before we get to the next, uh, I, I go on the COVID dashboard every day. I encourage people to go visit the COVID dashboard to see the trends in our community. As of this moment right now in the SMMUSD, there are 30 individuals in isolation. There are 10 positive cases of COVID-19 and 65 individuals on quarantine. All right, I turn my mic off. The next speaker is Annika Evans and then Chris Mock. Okay, yeah, I, there are so many people that actually have COVID right now, but how sick are they? I just want to comment that since you have to put that out there. You know, I, I don't, there's probably no more than a few cold symptoms. It's even, even if they don't have symptoms at all, if they come up positive, they still count it as COVID. So you can't look at the numbers. You should look at who's really sick from this, really sick from this, because there's no people that are anymore much, especially not kids. And, you know, like I said before, this is a false place of emergency. It's no emergency anymore. That's all. Thank you. The final speaker on this item is Chris Mock. Hello. Good evening, board members. I feel like I haven't been here in a while. 
I hope you all are well. I see some of you there at, in the building, some of you at home. Um, I just wanted to, you know, Kerry said it very, very well. Um, he said it actually hit all the points I wanted to make. Um, we did meet with the with the um, with him, and I want to thank him and Dr. Kelly for our conversation and for uh, really hearing us out on this uh, contracting out of our staff. Of course, it's not something that we like to do, but uh, is needed in this in this state of emergency. And right now, we are in a uh, if anybody, all of our staff are really working um, way above the board and, and just really uh, doing a great job, um, and, but are just working overtime and are pushing, you know, pushing the, putting in the extra work. And it's really, really proud of a lot of our workers, but particularly our, our custodians um, who have really been laid quite a lot of, of additional assignments, additional work with cleaning and stuff that has been given to them. So uh, I thank Carrie and, and the district for their conversation in this. We look forward to monitoring this closely and, uh, and getting things clean and, and uh, getting through this together. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Chris Mock. Uh, and I, I do wanna, Chris, thank, thank you for, for, uh, for chiming in on uh, what you worked on with Carrie and Dr. Kelly. And I just do wanna remind you, please, uh, we, we often at these meetings, compliment the incredible work of uh, the brothers and sisters at uh, CTA, as well as SEIU. So please pass on our, our deepest thank you to, to the members of SEIU. Thank you. Uh, I will now ask for a motion for this item. Lori, seconded by Jennifer. Are there any other board member comments on this? Richard. Um, thank you, um, John. I just wanted to kind of um, reiterate, not reiterate, echo what you just said to Chris. I really wanna thank Carrie and Dr. Drotti and Chris and um, our bargaining unit, because I am one who typically is opposed to outsourcing. Um, um, so it's very important that it's union jobs. I'm very happy to hear that our um, bargaining unit has, uh, feels that they have been engaged and that they are supportive of this and it's limited use for this particular moment. So I just wanna kudos to um, Dr. Drotti, your team for making sure to engage our bargaining unit. And thank you, Chris, for sure. Let's thank you, me. Richard. Are there any other board member comments or questions? Okay, so I'll ask for a roll call. Jennifer. Yes. Lori. Yes. Maria. Yes. Nathan. Yes. Richard. Yes. Craig. Yes. Felix. Yes. Heath. Yes. And I'm a yes, so that resolution passes. Our Final resolution is item F4. And a lot of these are all related to the same issue. This F4 is approve agreement with allied janitorial services to provide custodial contractor services under the resolution delegating authority to enter into contracts necessitated by COVID-19 safety operations. You can see how the past two resolutions have brought us to this one. I will ask for a motion and a second, and then we can have some clarifying. Moved by Lori, seconded by Keith. Uh, Carrie, I know you've spoken to this issue already twice. Can you just bring it home for us? Absolutely. So as I said, uh, this is the agreement that we would have with Allied Janitorial Services to provide the custodial contractor. Uh, this would provide, um, uh, we've written it so for it to go up to 20, we will believe we will start with 15. And this is for essentially the eight weeks. Yes, it's only eight weeks till Christmas, folks. Uh, eight weeks until the winter break. Uh, if we find that we're going to need to continue it, uh, we'll bring uh, a, 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 an amendment to the contract back, you know, at the December meeting. But our hope is that by that time, things will have changed in our um the COVID protocols will have altered. Uh, uh, I do wanna reiterate, we're, we're not doing this because we're liking it. We're doing this because we are required to follow the protocols set forth by the Department of Health. Uh, those cleaning protocols, uh, whatever anyone thinks about them, we don't have a choice. We are required to do them. And we wanna make sure that we're maintaining the best safe facilities for our, for our students. And this is our means to do that. Anything clarifying for Carrie from any board members? Okay, we have one public comment. Then. Yeah, uh, Chris Mock again. Um, if you're still there. I don't see you. Oh, sure yeah, you're uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I said what I needed to say before. So sorry, I have nothing to say to this other than there you can ask <laughs> like that. All right. So thank you, Chris. 
Thank you. Appreciate Thank that. you. So I will ask board members if there's any comments or questions for staff. So I will ask for a roll call vote then. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. Lori. Yes. Keith. Yes. Richard. Yes. Craig. Yes. Felix. Yes. Felix. Okay. Nathan. Yes. Maria. Yes. And I'm a yes. So that resolution is passed. Wonderful. And we are actually are on time for our seven o'clock timestamp at 7.01. So there you go. Uh, Dr. Drati, do you want to introduce our discussion item, which is really the, the, the remainder of this meeting is really going to be this topic, which is uh, update on COVID-19. Where are we? What's going on? Where are we going? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, man, we timed that well, right at seven o'clock. So <laughs> I, I do have other speakers are gonna help, help help me out in this presentation. So they'll, they'll be standing by. So um, I'm glad we did this on time. So that way you don't have to wait for a long time to, uh, to present. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So let me know if I, you guys are able to see it. Awesome. So um, uh, I, I'm here to provide an update, uh, uh, the update. And this is based. This is based on the direction you gave me at the last board meeting on September 22nd, I believe it was, that you want me to come back with information. And so this presentation is aligned with the direction you gave me. And, um, and incidentally, uh, I know we forgot to thank Melody Kennedy for being a part of the negotiations with uh, SEIU to bring the custodian. So I want to make sure the contract. So I want to make sure that she's also uh, thanked as well. And then for, for the parents, I, I know I heard tonight that there are many, several parents that think the emergency is over. And uh, I guess I'll urge you, if you do believe that, uh, it, uh, the people you should argue with is, is the LA County Department of Public Health. It's not necessarily the school district. But by law, we cannot break the rules of the LA County Department of Public Health. So that type of advocacy, in my opinion, to really go towards that department, if you do fully truly feel that way, that the emergency is over. But uh, but according to the county department of public health, it is not over. As a result, we as a district have to follow that, and um, and that's what we're doing. And and we want to keep it, we want to keep the students and staff safe. With that said, let's get let's get right to it. So in today's so tonight. Um, We'll give you an update on the weekly uh, screen testing, um, and uh, I'll have uh, some of my uh, the nurse, uh, nurses explain how that's gone. Uh, we're also going to have an update on student and staff vaccination rates, uh, and I'm sure you know you, you all know that uh, a lot of our students uh, that are um, in the secondary have the ability to get vaccinated. So we want to know how many of those students are. We have an approximate number of how many students are vaccinated. And we also have an approximate number of how many staff are vaccinated as well. Uh, and then we'll give you an update on the quarantine process uh, for exposed students. I know that was a major conversation we had at the last board meeting. So, and you also gave us direction to do, develop some things. So we'll give an update on where we are with that. And then uh, in between the last board meeting and now, we did not know this was going to happen, but Governor Newsom did come out and make an announcement on October 1st, 2021, regarding his desire for a statewide vaccine mandate for students. I think that has a bearing on the conversation tonight. So I'll, I'll talk about the specifics of that and what we at least know about the governor's intent and the announcement he made. And then and I, I am bringing on a local expert to come talk about this vaccine safety and hesitancy. Um, um, uh, and uh, I think uh, as we formulate our 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 uh, uh, ideals or or um, suggestions that you might want to give the, the the district or the staff to look into in terms of vaccine uh, having a vaccination uh, for our students, mandatory vaccination for our students. I think uh, I would love for that person to also explain. Uh, uh, about the vaccine and safety of it and, and hesitancy that exists out there. And then lastly, and for those of board members, why all this, I need, I, I need to obtain direction from you regarding um, uh, the SMU at these considerations for implementing vaccine mandate for students. So that'll be at the end of the day what we will need. 
So let's start off with this with uh, how our testing is going. I'll further invite up uh, our nurse Barrett. He's, she's been a champion of really coordinating all of the nursing testing, uh, 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 testing strategies, and uh, she's done a wonderful job at that. Uh, so Mrs. Nurse Barrett, why don't you take us through just how the weekly screen testing is going? I mean, you have uh, pretty good information there. And then I'll bring up two esteemed principals of ours. One is the elementary, Dr. Ashley Benjamin from McKinley Elementary, and then Mr. Patrick Miller from Malibu High. And, and those two will talk about just uh, their experience with the testing uh, from the beginning to now, uh, how that's been going. So uh, uh, Nurse Barrett, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it from here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I just wanted to go over our testing program um, and note that we did start kind of slow, but we are in the ninth week of testing. Uh, during that time, we've uh, completed over 62,500 tests on both staff and students. Looking just at that, not at any of the um, tests that are coming in from outside from symptomatic individuals, the district positivity rate is less than a tenth of a percent, which is excellent. And I know that some of you will feel like that's echoing what you're saying. Um, I'm really proud of our kids and our staff for the measures that they're taking. Um, just want to put that out there. Um, the testing. Um, started out a little bit slow, had some hiccups, but is now rolling smoothly, no issues on the ground. Um, everything goes through, like I said, sm smoothly. Um, the tests coming in from outside are obviously a very different positivity rate. So this is just for our um, asymptomatic screening. And it is important to know, I think that that 0.1% is where we would expect a screening program to be. So we're within that uh, range. That's it uh, just on the testing. Yeah. So let me uh, bring up Dr. Benjamin to just talk about the experience. You know, we, we're, uh, I wanted uh, 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 elementary discuss because those are early ages and, and initially there were a lot of concerns that our younger students are going to have some kind of anxiety or whatnot with the testing. So I would love for Dr. Ashley Benjamin to speak to how, what she has seen at McKinley Elementary School. Dr. Dr. Benjamin? Sure, I'd be happy to share. Hi everyone. So prior to testing starting at McKinley, I'd actually made a video for students demonstrating how to do the COVID swab. So I never thought as a principal, I'd be making a movie sticking a little swab up my nose, but just that kind of year. But I'm glad I did it because the video really seemed to help lower students' anxiety. And they knew what to expect on the first day of testing. So it seemed to really help. And since then, the testing process itself has been going great. Um, it's extremely quick. It takes five minutes from start to finish for each class. And how it works at McKinley is every class has an assigned time and they come one at a time between 8.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. We have desks and pop-up tents on our grass where the testers are stationed and first students line up and then they walk to the first desk and then they state their name, they're handed their little labeled tube and then they move to the next area where we have five desks and five testing staff. So with having so many testers, it can move really quickly with four to five students self-swabbing at once. So it's very easy and students have it down at this point. I watch our youngest students from our preschoolers and our TK and K students able to easily and confidently do it by themselves. And we get the results the next afternoon, the day after testing. So within 24 hours, we know if there's any positives. And I'm proud to say that so far we've had zero positive tests and no positive, on case, no positive cases on campus this entire school year. So it's really been a great team effort with the community, everyone being safe both at school and outside of school. And I would say overall the testing has been really beneficial. It's a uh, minimal impact to the school day being only five minutes per class. Kids are tolerating it really well. And it's been very helpful to be informed and aware of COVID in our community. So we feel safe and comfortable coming to school and then having the information so we can better keep our students safe and healthy if there was a positive case. So overall going really great at McKinley. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, Mr. Patrick Miller, Malibu High School. 
Yep, good evening, and thank you for having me. And I don't want to parrot Dr. Benjamin, but really it's been, now it feels like we've been doing it for years. It's, it's really seamless. It's very non-disruptive. Our kids basically go, and within five minutes to 10 minutes, their class is done. I'll, I'll start with a couple numbers and nuggets just for our Malibu Middle School and Malibu High School. And to give a context to community members who may not be as familiar with our site, we're talking about about 700 students. Uh, we only have three families, five total students who opted out of the school-based program. Every other student and family opted into the program and are participating in the on-campus testing. We had zero students go to independent study program as a result of the required weekly screening testing. Uh, we had about 15 to 20 students request accommodations for a spit test. Um, but as testing has gone underway, we've had about a third of those families and students remove that accommodation to do the nasal test once they saw how the process went, went and was more comfortable with it. Um, like Ashley said, uh, we have two tables set up, one for Malibu Middle School, one for Malibu High School. There's about four members of the Malibu Medical Group staff. Uh, Malibu Medical Group was great about accommodating some of our initial um, concerns regarding logistics as far as time being a secondary site where students rotate classes, we couldn't have them just for a couple hours. We needed them throughout the duration of the day. So they're on campus from 8.30 to 3.30. The classes go down by a content area, again, being secondary where kids rotate in middle school, middle school science, middle school English, middle school history, in high school, middle school, uh, high school English, high school history. They go with their teacher during that period. It's about a five minute process. Malibu Medical Group, we've moved their locations closer to the classroom so that kind of walking time between the testing and the classroom is, is as shortened as it can be. Um, because we're secondary students, it's the same process Ashley, Dr. Benjamin described. Um, the students go down, they state their name, they get a label, they get their test tube, their swab, they administer it, self-administer it in front of the Malibu Medical Group, hand it back and they're done. It really is in and out. Um, Felix could probably highlight student sentiment much better than I can, but really I've heard a lot more students um, really appreciating the opportunity to test on campus. Unlike Dr. Benjamin, we have had a couple positive cases as a result of the screening testing. In those situations, my medical group has been great about their communication with us. Again, we get our results within 24 hours, similar to what Dr. Benjamin described. Um, and they then also follow up with the family of those positive cases on top of our school and school district process. Um, so yeah, really the biggest challenge was the initial tracking of the consent forms and getting it going. But as we've gotten it going, it has just become part of, we call it testing Tuesday. Um, and it's just kind of become part of our school routine. And if there's other questions or specific information, I'm happy to give it. You don't call it Taco Tuesday, testing Tuesday. <laughs> we, we said to the kids, it's like Taco Tuesday, but it's testing Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you, you know, uh, I, I'm gonna have Nurse Barrett for a little bit, but I know Dr. Benjamin and Patrick, I, I, I wanna thank them and that they're gonna sign off and go deal with stuff. But uh, first I wanna say they are here representing the, the rest of the principals and and um, they, they I wanna thank them and all the other principals for their courage, their dedication and creativity in making this work. Uh, they were there in the beginning when the frustrations were there. People had misunderstandings. So they fielded a lot of questions. And uh, initially when I was drowning with being able to communicate with everyone, when I went to them, I said, look, I need you guys to start communicating with your families and with specific information. They rolled the sleeves up and they went to work and, and, and that's how the information was disseminated. And, and the results of their work is what you, what you just heard. So I wanna thank uh, Dr. Benjamin and Patrick Miller and the rest of the principals for all their work that they've done. So thank you. And thank you, your staff as well, uh, for their coordination and, 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 and advocacy and support of this work. So thank you. So right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask um, one of the areas that uh, you wanted me to uh, really talk about the last time was uh, that now that we are testing students, uh, the challenges that resulted from when the students were exposed. If you recall, there were issues with just the short-term quarantining and, and, and all of that. Uh, that Obviously, you just heard that things are smoother. McKinley, for example, didn't have to go through this issue because they didn't have any positive tests. And Malibu High had a minimum amount, but there are disruptions that occur where students are exposed and so on. And I think at that time, 
there were there were new protocols coming out emerging where you can shorten the amount of quarantine days and then also a possibility of having in school quarantine and you want us to you, you directed me to investigate those things and uh, nurse barrett and nurses did an awesome job to to, uh, to establish the infrastructure so i'm going to have nurse barrett I, I don't know if Rachel, nurse rachel is here also but uh but uh, if she is, you can jump in with uh, but Nurse Barrett. Why don't you take us through the slide and explain what's, what's been going on? Sure, I'd be happy. I believe Rachel's listening in. So if she has something to say, she is more than welcome to jump in at any point. Um, so the 10 day quarantine, or kind of traditional or normal quarantine, uh, is still available to anybody that chooses uh, to participate in that, if that's the best option for their family um, related to exposure. It's still available. It's available for um, all cases of exposure. Uh, the new guidelines that came out in the middle of last month were the opportunity to have a seven day quarantine with testing um, added and an in school quarantine. Now, I just wanna clarify that the county are calling both of these like a modified quarantine but to keep the confusion away, we're just going to refer to them as a shortened quarantine and the in-school quarantine. Um, these can be applied in some cases. They're not available to all. And it's based on the guidelines for the county, what the um, details of the exposure were. And initially, our ability as a district provide the infrastructure, including increased testing, um, to support that. Now, we do have in place a strike team. We formed a district strike team that's housed at one site, but is able to deploy out to help other sites as needed and provide the additional testing in addition to what's already happening. So if, for example, there is an exposure at one school that requires, you know, they, they test on Monday and the exposed kids in order to come back uh, the following Monday, let's say, would need to test on Friday of the week before. These are just made up dates. Um, the testing on Friday, instead of having families try to go out and find something in the community, um, we're now able to have a set time for each case where you can come to your student's primary site. Um, they it's not hubbed at one location. So if you, if your student attends Rogers and they're exposed at Rogers, they can test at Rogers during the dedicated time on one of the days that are um, available. And the days are dictated by, again, the details of the case. Um, our first group that had a shortened quarantine was piloted um, just five days after the uh, updated guidance from the county came out. The in-school quarantine uh, was evaluated each case that came up after the guidelines were updated, but the details of the requirements they need to meet in order to be eligible for that are so strict that we didn't have a group that met all the criteria until uh, the 13th of this month. So we did run our first pilot starting on the 13th with an exposure group that was um, at one of our sites. Um, I'm happy to expand on that more if the board has questions, um, clarify later, but I'll just, I'll, I'll keep it simple. So we are evaluating each uh, group. We have a minimally staffed strike team of people to support uh, both on the tracking of the cases and on, on the testing side. And uh, I think that's it for now. Just in summary, um... When you gave us the direction to move in this direction, we we met on several occasions and we identified which groups would probably benefit best from the uh, from the in school quarantine and uh, and so on. So at the same time, when we analyzed what needed to be done, we quickly realized the intricate details and communication and logistics that would have to take place to address this. And at that time. We did not have really the staff to 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 address this and to implement this without establishing an infrastructure would have been would have been um, uh, very stressful for staff. Uh, right now, staff all staffs work under heavy stress and and just all, all over the nation. 
And so, but, but with the nurses and the principals, we met and we identified that we needed to actually uh, uh, hire uh, more staff uh, to help with that, uh, that, the logistics. So that's a lot of time was spent on that. Um, and so working with uh, HR and working with uh, uh, the commission, we were able to bring some people on and that's the strike team that Ms. Barrett was talking about. So I wanna thank her for really helping to help coordinate that and she, her and Rachel Barrett was, were being relentless in trying to get this done. So thank you, thank you for that. We'll go to the next slide here. I'm so sorry, right can, now, I, can I make uh, one more clarification on that? Yes. I just, I forgot to um, go over. The in-school quarantine is being used primarily right now for grades six to eight. And I just wanted to clarify why that is, if anybody was uh, confused, because the um, high school students, uh, were, which you'll see on the next slide, have a higher vaccination rate and uh, people may feel more comfortable. Um, the elementary students don't rotate through classes, so they have fewer opportunities for exposure. But our middle school kiddos get caught in that gap of many of them are not eligible to be vaccinated yet and they are rotating through classes. So there's a greater uh, chance of exposure just from the number of people they're interacting with. You can move on. Okay. Before you guys move on, is I have a question about in-school quarantine. Is this the time to ask it or should I wait till the yeah. end? Yeah, you, yeah. Is it, yeah, you might as well because okay. it gets pretty complicated. So when we yeah. get to the other topics, it'll be, it may get lost, so. <laughs> okay, good. It's already complicated. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, so I, I was one of the board members who expressed a desire to <clears throat> move to in-school quarantine where possible and as soon as possible, not faster or different, but where possible and as soon as possible. And I'm not entirely sure I understand that there are additional, there were complexities and you discovered added complexities as you looked further at implementing it. But what I'm not clear on is where do we stand today with regard to in-school quarantine and the likelihood that we will roll that out more broadly, both in terms of in more school sites, but also K-5. And I also think you referred to only certain instances uh, um, are eligible for in-school quarantine? And is that an LA County rule and what might those be? But my real, the core question I'm asking is, can you give us some um, con like constructive, uh, some um, predictive information about when we might be able to do it and uh, more broadly and how, what grade spans Absolutely. So, hey, hey, Nurse, I, I wanna... hey, hey, let me speak to uh, why the decisions for certain grade spans uh, are, are more precedent than others, and then and then you can come in and talk about where we are in terms of our rollout. Uh, uh, so, so, so uh, after you guys gave me the superintendent the the direction to, to explore this, uh, I immediately called the principals together. Uh, we had a deep conversation around and the nurses about analyzing what it would take and Nurse Bear will speak to some of the rules for in, in, in uh, school quarantine in a little bit. But from there, um, when we spoke to the high school uh, 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 the principals, uh, uh, essentially when you look at the numbers, a vast majority of high school students are, are quarantined already. And as a result, they're protect that's the most protection you can have where you can skip quarantining Unless you are the, the vaccine. I'm sorry. What, what did I say? Quarantine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're listening the, the, to you. The students, are, the students are vaccinated already. That is the best protection you can have because the LA County Department of Health, Public Health says that if you are exposed as a vaccinated individual, you don't have to quarantine. So at the high school level, the principals quickly mentioned that the minute students started getting quarantined uh, and they discovered that. Uh, being vaccinated protected them. It, it, it word got out very quickly, so a lot of the students uh, are, are, are quarantined already. So, so in their minds, they're vaccinated already. It's so, already. <laughs> sorry, it's getting late. <laughs> in their, in their, uh, so in their opinion, 
they, although the in, in person quarantine will be great, particularly for, uh, will be great, uh, 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 they, they, they're not the primary goal. And then we went to elementary. Uh, okay, what about elementary? The issue with the elementary is um, grade one to five, just because we don't have seating charts and the way we teach people are moving around and things like that. Anytime there's a, a, a case at a school, uh, it, 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 it becomes very easy to just identify that through our uh, the tracking process that you have to quarantine the entire class. When that happens, when that happens, the teachers also, then we switch to the whole teaching from uh, uh, remotely model. And the whole class is either learning from home and the teachers teach it from the classroom or, or, or they're all teaching from home. But the point is, there is no splitting of, a, of students. If the, if the situation becomes where we introduce this and then you have half the kids, half the kids at home and half the kids on campus, then you would just introduce another complexity uh, into a formula that would have uh, 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 that would have given us headaches. So I think we we came up with the idea that uh, let's 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 not focus on a grade K K to five. Our primary goal, if we were going to do anything, was going to be grade six because that those are the students where uh, they go through several classes, and 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 we're able to isolate students. So it's a it's a it's a grade level where have sometimes five, six, seven kids are exposed and they're home and and then they go through seven classes, seven, uh, uh, not seven, six different classes with different subjects. So it becomes very difficult to, to educate those students while they're in their short term at home, while the teachers are teaching the rest of the kids on campus. So at that point, we decided that's, that, that, is, that has to be our, our primary uh, group that we have to really focus in on. So, so we wanted to make sure that we secure them. If we're going to isolate them, if we're going to quarantine them, we at least to try to make them uh, quarantined uh, on campus, so that's that's what we went with, um, and then and then and then from seventh to eighth and so on. Uh, but but the 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 kicker of all this is the uh, because the infrastructure for in school quarantine is in place, we can now execute the shortened quarantine because it, it, we go through the same logistical process of communications and so on. So right now, uh, I would, and Nurse Bear will have to verify this, but. Right now, we have the ability to do short quarantine for everyone, for the exposed students, not for the not for the positive student, but the uh, for the exposed student. So anyway, I'll stop here. Let's Barrett, why don't you take over from? Well, could I? Could I? Ask yeah, I just, just sort of maybe she can address this too in the realm of this quarantine yeah. because the other um, while you the, the only other thing that I would say is that the other complication is when. She, elementary school students are in childcare. Yeah. And that creates a, um, an issue and that this might be helpful. So maybe yes. you could address that too. Yes. Okay. So um, yes, there are several things I think that need a little bit of clarification here. First, again, just with our keeping our language concise and clear, um, isolation is the student that tested positive and it, or is for the student that tests positive or has symptoms quarantine is only for exposed students. So when we're talking about quarantine, this is not for anybody that tested positive. If you test positive or have symptoms, um, you're gonna be out the 10 days, unless you you know exit the COVID track. If it's not COVID related at all, then it has its own isolation period. Um, so quarantine is only for exposed kids. And the um, decision about the younger ones, I think like Dr. Trotty said, was made to not split the class. Um, but let me explain some of the criteria. One of the major points um, of the criteria to be eligible for the in-school quarantine is that the exposure has to only have been on campus during school activities that were completely supervised and they have to have verified only mask to mask contact meaning that the individual that tested positive and the individual that were exposed were both fully and properly masked the entire time during the exposure. Which means for our kids that are in a classroom together at the elementary level, they're also eating lunch together. And the kids that eat lunch 
within that six feet. So if you're sitting next to the person that tested positive, then you would have to go home and do a home quarantine. And the rest of the class would be eligible for um, an in-school quarantine. And so we thought that it would be prudent at this time to keep them moving toward the shortened quarantine, but at home so that the whole class can learn together at the younger grades. Now for sixth and up, since they have independent schedules anyway, um, it's not as much of an issue that the social contacts um, do have to do a home quarantine because it's, you know, we're, we're minimizing harm and we're getting some of them to be able to stay in. Um, it's also not eligible if the, um, like it was a social exposure or if it was an exposure to an outside, you know, a family member or a friend um, not associated with campus. So I don't know if that clarifies some. Oh, the other thing I'll add is, so when I'm saying if they're eligible, we're evaluating every single case. We go through, we interview teachers and the reason why the other cases were not eligible was because there were not individuals that had only mask to mask contact. Um, so they were either all social exposures or they were students that were inconsistently masking um, either the index case or the student that was exposed. Um, but we do have the infrastructure in place to support with the strike team, um, any case that comes up where they meet the requirements that are set out by LA County um, that we, we can move forward and we will be doing in school quarantines for anybody that meets those requirements that chooses to participate in the program. Yeah, so so uh, I think, Craig, uh, th I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, that was a lot, so. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fine for now. I think I understand what I need to understand. Thank you. If, if I can just add one other thing, because I don't, it, just anticipating maybe some of the thought process. Um, once there is approval for vaccination for the younger groups, and they voluntarily, like if parents are choosing to have students vaccinated, once we have vaccinated individuals that would not need to quarantine and the class would otherwise be split anyway, then we would absolutely be interested in supporting and moving forward to keep as many students as we can in the classroom um, if they're already gonna be kind of split up into to Zoom and not. Good point. So I want to move on to uh, the next slide here. Uh, one of the one of your interests was to really understand the vaccination status of, of our district. Uh, so we collected information, and, uh, and so the nurses and Dr. Kelly will speak to the vaccination rates. Uh, nurses will speak to the students, what we know so far right now, and then uh, Dr. Kelly will speak to the employees, uh, and also the nurses will also talk about this the vaccination process and how that actually benefits us keeping kids on campus. So uh, Nurse Barrett and Rachel, why don't you take over? Sure, so the, um, as you can see, one of the major benefits is for individuals who are exposed um, and that is off campus or on campus. Um, so it can be a social exposure who are asymptomatic and fully vaccinated, that's having one or both doses, depending on the manufacturer, and two weeks past the last dose at the time of exposure. As long as they remain asymptomatic, they do not have to quarantine. So they watch for symptoms and we are aware and may track them, but they're allowed to continue their business and their in-person instruction um, and, and their uh, social contacts as well. Um, so that ends up being a, a huge benefit for the students. Um, and you'll see after, I believe on the next slide, we're going to discuss uh, one of the cases that we actually had come up and I'll give you a kind of a real example. Um, looking at who even without any mandates, of course, at this point, just who's chosen to, to be vaccinated of the, uh, Santa Monica area high schools, um, the last risk is actually because it's the only school schools that we were not able to get through everyone. 
So I've analyzed about uh, 25 to 30% of the student body in a random sampling. And the vaccination rate there is 85.7% are fully vaccinated as of right now. We have an additional 3% that are partially vaccinated, um, whether that's less than two weeks past their second dose or they only have one. Um, I would say the majority of those are for, for all of the individuals that are partially vaccinated. Um, oh, it's maybe about a 50-50 of individuals that are eligible and due and past due for their second dose and maybe have chosen for some other reason not to get it. Um, and individuals that are in that interim where they just can't be counted as fully vaccinated yet. Um, and you'll see the smaller numbers for all the schools. Those are the individuals that are uh, percentage wise of the whole school that are uh, partially vaccinated. Um, the larger numbers <clears throat> for the high school, that's of the total student body population. For the middle schools, it was analyzed based on those who were eligible. So um, the obviously met many of our sixth graders are not 12 yet. And so they are not eligible for vaccination. Um, I'll hand it over for employees and then I'll come back on the next slide. Yes, uh, Dr. Kelly, why don't you speak to the employees? Sure. I, I just want to say that you know, very pleased at the terrific response from our employees in terms of, of um, being vaccinated and, and in support of the board's resolution. Uh, as you can see there, uh, 95, just over 95% of the employees are vaccinated. That does include uh, about two and a half percent of those are uh, have the first dose and are in the process of being fully vaccinated. So that's about 92.5% fully vaccinated, which is really a terrific number. And, and I want to recognize uh, my own staff, in particular, Catherine Qureshi and Human Resources, who's been managing all the intake of documentation of this uh, it, it, and, and thank all the employees for their patience and cooperation. Um, but I do think we, we really have had a terrific response um, and, and cooperation from the employees and we're pleased with how it's going. So uh, Nurse Barrett and Rachel, why don't you speak to this slide? It's pretty interesting. Rachel, did you want to jump in? You're welcome to, if you want. No? Okay. <laughs> I'll come in. I'll come in. Hi, everybody. Um, our final slide was actually a real, real situation. Um, and it just sort of showed us how we can sort of whittle down, you know, who really has to stay home from school. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, there were eight positive cases at SAMO. And what you can see is those eight are in those little red dots on the left. Those are the people who are staying at home. They've been either a positive case with symptoms or a positive case without symptoms, and they are away. They're, they're gone. They're staying home from school. We then, knowing those eight positive cases and all the contact tracing that had to go along with that, which is the very large endeavor that all of us are doing, um, that yielded about 450 exposures. So there were 450 people that these eight positive people were around at some point during the school day and they were considered close contacts. And in that contact tracing and the interviewing and the finding out who's vaccinated, fully vaccinated, we were able to whittle down from 450 to about 380 people that were full child students and staff that were fully vaccinated. So those people could stay at school. So, you know, you start with 450, you get to 380, those people are staying, those kids are staying at school, the staff are teaching, the children are learning. And so we ended up with fewer than 70 students that actually had to be quarantined. And so those students stayed at home. So I just really, we wanted you to see that, that that was the benefit of having vaccinations at, and then certainly, you know, high school with a volume like that, um, you know, it was really, it really, really showed the work of everybody who is vaccinated and how we're trying to find out who is vaccinated and, you know, what this all entails, which is the bottom line of uh, people 
staying at school, staying at work and um, learning. So we wanted you to so, see that. So that happened two weeks ago. Dr. Kelly? Yeah, I just wanna to, to join in uh, what Nurse Pressler has said because those exposures are not just limited. She's talking about students, but there's also staff involved in that. Mm -hmm. And when they're vaccinated, they too can remain on campus. And we know that that's a primary interest of the board is to keep teaching and learning going during this difficult time. And I think, again, as you see here, this is a wonderful example in the student situation, but all of these students are also having contact with adults and they're being vaccinated, allows them to keep working and doing what they're doing and keep the continuity of teaching and learning going. Yeah, thank you, great, great point. To, to piggyback on that just a little bit, I um, would add that um, I personally had to quarantine less than five staff members for uh, campus-based exposures because they are, you know, following the protocols, still attempting to distance as much as possible and largely vaccinated. So it's been very positive. Well, thank you, thank you. So, um, uh, so I'm gonna switch over to Governor Newsom's announced press release that he put out on uh, October 1st, uh, 2021. And this, this uh, announcement came unbeknownst to us after you gave me direction uh, to find information and data uh, for this meeting here. So I thought it was important to include that as a part of this presentation because this, this could also influence your thinking uh, as, you, as we contemplate what we're gonna do. So, so Governor Newsom uh, uh, put out a press release indicating that COVID vaccine will be required for students in grades K-12 as a, as a condition of, to attend uh, in school in person. So this has been a big buzz and, uh, dist uh, and districts throughout the state of California. There's a lot of confusion about this. Um, and I kind of, um, uh, I'll go over this uh, a little bit of where the confusion lies. Uh, in there, the governor for the director of the California Department of Public Health to follow the California legislative procedures to add the COVID-19 to a list of required vaccines required for in-person school instruction. Uh, so, uh, you know, like I said, the information is pretty vague, and uh, so there, there, there. So there's been a lot of analysis by legal, by legal firms, by different people, just to try to understand what the press release meant. Uh, the language suggests that the governor intends to abide by current requirements of the health and safety code, including those which uh, allow for personal belief uh, exemptions when additional vaccines are required. Okay. So what is the takeaway? This is, this is from legal counsel that uh, I've been communicating with this around this, this issue. So the takeaway here is that the governor issued a press release, not an executive order, okay? He put out a press release, not an executive order. As such, the press release does not constitute a change in the law, okay? Secondly, the press release does not clarify what requirements become effective on the January 1st or July 1st following full FDA approval for COVID-19 vaccine for any grade, any grade span. So that's another takeaway. Instead, it simply states that the requirements take effect at the start of the term following full approval for that grade span to be defined as January 1st or July 1st, whichever comes first. Based on the current information, that requirement is expected to apply to grade seven through 12 starting July 1st, 2022. So, the, so further, furthermore, uh, so to drill that even further, the statewide vaccine mandate for students by Governor uh, Newsom, if we, it is to take place, requires that a formal executive order must be in place or, or legislative action for it to take place. So this is what we're thinking he's gonna do. Uh, the we're going to do, we just don't know when yet. Uh, but so, so, so far, right now, no such action has been taken at this time. So we're just being advised to really watch, pay attention, and, 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 and prepare yourselves if, 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 it, if it does come into play. Um, so I think that's an important information for us to have here, um, uh, because as we consider the future for the district, 
uh, regarding uh, uh, vaccine mandates for students. I, I think this, this timeline is also um, uh, information we should have in, in mind as we uh, consider what happened in this district. So if you, if you take what he has, uh, we kind of do a little exercise uh, of what, what the timeline would look like if, if, if the FDA approval does take place. So let's just take example number one. The Federal Drug Administration fully approves the COVID vaccine for children ages 12 and older on December 1st this year. Let's just say that happens. By January 1st, 2022, or 2022, all students who are 12 years of age or older must be vaccinated for COVID-19 as a condition for attending school in person. That is theoretically what could happen, is what I'm saying. But remember what I said was there has to be some kind of legislative action or executive order for that to take place uh, for that to occur. I I'm not sure if that's gonna happen or not. Example number two, the FDA approves the COVID-19 vaccine for children ages five and 11 uh, and older on May 1st, 2022. By July, theoretically, by July uh, 1st, 2022, all students who are ages five and 11 uh, must be vaccinated for COVID-19 as a condition of attending school in person. Again, this is theoretical based on what we know. Um, again, there still has, either has to be an executive order or legislative action for, for any of this to take place. So I just kind of want that out there so, so we know, we know what our options are as we consider, uh, or what the conditions are as we consider moving forward. What I want to do is before I uh, I uh, end by uh, uh, clarifying uh, for having you ask me clarifying questions, and then before I uh, ask for direction uh, for you to give me, uh, I wanted to bring on a local expert that I've been in communication with often. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but I mean, <laughs> seems like I. It's, all superintendents really have to become knowledgeable about. So we 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 are in constant meetings with the, the LA County Department of Public Health. Uh, beyond that, we have local people that help us make the decisions through our um, health and safety DACs. So we have local experts around here that we reach out to to help us answer questions and so on. What I wanted to do was invite uh, one of our local experts that I've been in communication with. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Will Nicholas is an epidemiologist, and I'll have him explain what that is. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's the director of, uh, for the Center for Health and, uh, Impact Evaluation, the Eddie County Department of Public Health. They, they, deal, they deal with infectious diseases. He's well known. And uh, so I'm going to have Mr. Dr. Will Nicholas just talk about vaccine safety, hesitancy. Um, you know, I, I was initially going to have another town hall just to talk about this, but given our time and capacity, is just you know what? Let me just bring some people here at this board meeting to talk. So, so with that said, uh, Doctor Will Nicholas, would you um, uh, would you take over from here? And thank you for being here, by the way. I know I'm disturbing your dinner and all that, but I do appreciate you <laughs> you being on here. <laughs> no, my my pleasure, Doctor Dreddy. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Excellent. Good. Well, again, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, let me just preface my remarks by acknowledging that as a public health professional and a parent, I'm extremely aware of the strong feelings that vaccine mandates evoke for some people. And I understand that my brief remarks here aren't necessarily going to cause people to change their personal beliefs to which they have are, you know, are, are absolutely entitled. Uh, but that said, what I'd like to accomplish in, in the little bit of time that I have with you is to briefly explain th three things in the, to the best of my ability. And those three things are how the COVID-19 vaccine works, how it, what, 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 what's, how it activates, two, how effective these vaccines are at preventing serious illness and death, and three, what are some of the potential side effects of the vaccines? So starting with how the vaccine works. In a nutshell, basically the three vaccines that have been uh, full now fully approved by the FDA, ultimately they all do the same thing, but through slightly different mechanisms. And what they do is they basically cause our cells in our bodies to produce what I would call fake versions of the little spike cells 
uh, on the COVID-19 virus that help the virus infect our cells. So if you've ever seen a picture of the COVID virus, it's like a little globe with those little things sticking out of it. Those are the spike proteins. And so the virus, the, 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 the vaccines cause our cells to produce fake versions of those spikes so that um, when our immune systems detect those fake spikes, uh, those fake, fake spike proteins on the cells, they mount an immune response. And so in the future, if we are exposed to the real COVID-19 vaccine, our immune systems are already trained to fight it. So again, it's a very similar to the mechanism of, of, of many vaccines. So two of the vaccines that I wanna talk a little bit more about, um, these are the, uh, the so-called mRNA vaccines, messenger RNA. These are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. They're the most commonly used at this point in, the, in this country. And of course, Pfizer is one of those and it's currently the only one approved for, uh, for people aged 12 to 17. Uh, this mRNA vaccine technology is, is relatively new, um, but it was established uh, enough at the time that the COVID-19 pandemic arrived that a lot of the basic science had already been completed. And so this is one of the reasons why these vaccines could be developed relatively quickly uh, because they basically just had to adapt the, the existing science to this novel coronavirus. Of course, the other reason it was done so fast is because we, we uh, poured unprecedented amount of resources uh, to the development of, uh, to development of these vaccines because you know, thousands of people were dying every day and uh, the coronavirus soon became the leading cause of death in our country. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was a dire situation. So, so now I don't wanna get too technical, but I wanted to briefly address fears or concerns that mRNA vaccines somehow may be able to alter our DNA. Um, this is a, a common misunderstanding uh, that I that likely arises because when people hear the term mRNA, messenger RNA, RNA, it triggers fears about something that could affect our genetics because RNA is a component of our genetic system, right? mRNA, mRNA contains the genetic instructions for producing the proteins that are the building blocks for our bodily organs and tissues. But the key thing to understand is that mRNA is just a messenger molecule that leaves the cell's nucleus to produce proteins in the part of the cell that's outside of the nucleus. So it's impossible for mRNA to travel in the other direction or to re-enter the nucleus. And the nucleus is what houses our DNA. All of our DNA is in the nucleus. mRNA goes one direction from the nucleus out. So, so mRNA vaccines cannot affect our DNA because mRNA cannot enter the cell's nucleus. Another common misperception about uh, mRNA vaccines is that they can cause COVID-19 because they contain the virus itself. Um, this is also a, a misconception. The vaccine contains an isolated mRNA molecule from the COVID-19 virus with the instructions on how to produce that one isolated part of the virus, which is that spike protein, what I was talking about, that fake spike protein that teaches our cells how to fight off the COVID infection. So again, this is isolated molecule teaching, teaching our cells to produce a very small piece of the virus. So it's not the same at all as the live virus or even a neutralized version of the virus. So the vaccine does not contain the COVID-19 virus. mRNA vaccines also don't contain any fetal cells, nor were any fetal cells used to develop them. Um, I, I don't wanna go too into depth into fetal cell line research, but you know, if, if, if somebody's interested in talking about it later, I, I can do the best I can. But again, no, no fetal cells were used in the development of, of this virus. So next, moving on to how effective is the COVID-19 vaccine, right? So goes without saying, all of the vaccines, all three of them are, are extremely effective at preventing severe illness and death from COVID-19. However, as you all, likely know it's still possible to get infected if you've been vaccinated. And this is because the vaccine clinical trials, right, the trials that were used to develop the vaccines were designed to test the effectiveness of vaccines for preventing severe illness and death, not for preventing any level of infection. Uh, and no vaccine is 100% effective. And the goal of vaccines is to keep people safe from serious illness. So let me illustrate this a little bit um, about the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines using uh, recent data from, from LA County. This is, I think this is illustrative. I don't have slides, but I'm gonna speak slowly to, 
to kind of uh, make the point. So if you look at, we looked at all of our COVID-19 data as of October 9th, just about a little less than two weeks ago, right? And as of that point, approximately 5.7 million LA County residents had been fully vaccinated. Also at that point in time, of these, about 60,000 had tested positive. That represents 1% of all those fully vaccinated or, you know, and 1% sounds small, but when you get into big numbers, 1% can be a lot. So these 60,000 breakthrough infections represent about one out of every 100 people fully vaccinated. So I'm looking here, there's 142 people participating in this meeting. You know, if this is a roughly representative group of the county, at least 100 of us are vaccinated. So chances are that at least somebody participating in this meeting right now has had a breakthrough infection. Not that uncommon. Now, when you get to uh, hospitalizations, uh, the chances get less. So of those 60,000 people who had breakthrough infections as of October 9th, uh, 2,000 were hospitalized. So translated into percentages, that means that while 1% or one out of every 100 uh, fully vaccinated people got infected, only 0.036% or between three and four out of every 10,000 fully vaccinated people were hospitalized with COVID-19. So again, between three and four people out of 10,000 hospitalized, much, much smaller percent. And then also as of that October date, 311 people who were fully vaccinated, unfortunately died of COVID-19, representing 0.005%. And so that would be about five out of every 100,000 people uh, who are fully vaccinated. So um, th again, that helps to kind of illustrate a bit how, how, how unlikely it is uh, to get infected or hospitalized or to die if you're fully vaccinated. Another thing that's important to mention here is that the vast majority of these breakthrough cases and hospitalizations and deaths occurred among people over 70. I mean, we, we often use that statistic 65, but it's really, really 70 is looking like a, it's really where most of the, the uh, hospitalizations and deaths happen. So the chances of um, these breakthrough case deaths and cases and hospitalizations are much lower among younger people than among older people. And um, when we looked, we, we, we looked specifically at just this past September, the last, just a month ago, during the entire month of September, um, unvaccinated people, over 50 were about five times more likely to get infected than vaccinated people over 50. So, you know, significant amount of protection. Again, it's not too hard to get infected if you're, if you're, if you're fully vaccinated. By comparison, uh, we looked at kids 12 to 17, because we're now able to look at, at these, this group because a lot of them are getting vaccinated. Uh, but uh, among these unvaccinated kids age 12 to 17, they were eight times more likely to get infected than vaccinated kids age 12 to 17. So, so basically the vaccine is actually more effective at preventing infections among the very young than it is among the very old. Um, and I don't actually, fortunately, I don't have similar comparisons for hospitalizations and deaths because they are so exceedingly rare uh, among young people. Um, so lastly, let me just talk a little bit about side effects, right? So the most common side effects that everybody who's been vaccinated is aware of, they're common mild flu-like symptoms, including headache and fatigue. These occur with all vaccines and are signs basically that the vaccine is working and that your immune system is, is reacting. Um, there is evidence that these, 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 um, these types of reactions are a little bit more common among younger people. Um, I, I certainly experience them and I'd like to think it's because I'm, I'm young at heart and, and in any of you who experienced them, I'm sure yeah, I, I welcome you to, to uh, attribute that to your young spirit. Um, but anyway, that's, those are the mild symptoms. But what obviously what people are most concerned about are the more severe side effects, right? And so what we know about from, from vaccine uh, reaction reporting is that there's, there's four main, more serious side effects, all of which are very rare. Uh, the first is anaphylaxis. That's what they make you wait for 10 minutes or 15 minutes after you've gotten the shock. You can get anaphylactic shock. That is a more immediate reaction. And that's treatable. And that's why they make you wait there. Only about two to five people out of a million get that kind of a reaction. But the people at the testing site are prepared and they can treat you immediately. So that's, you know, again, it's a, it's a tr very rare but treatable side effect. The, the next two are really, really what uh, reactions to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Again, 
not as relevant here for discussion about uh, about young people, but there there's risks of blood clots, uh, particularly among uh, women age 18 to 49. There are about seven per million uh, in this age group. But again, this, these only occurred uh, among people who had the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. But again, low low, uh, and then even lower than seven per million among among men and among women over 50. Um, then there's, a, a, again, a rare uh, neurologic disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, also only reported among people who got the J&J vaccine, about eight per million overall, uh, more, particularly more common among men uh, over age 50. But lastly, let me talk about the one that probably for parents who are most concerned about getting their kids vaccinated, this is the one they've probably heard about the most, and this is uh, myocarditis and pericarditis. Uh, which basically are conditions that consist of an inflammation of the heart muscle or the outer lining of the heart caused by the immune response that, the, uh, that, that, that comes from the vaccine. Um, and the reason parents may have heard of this one is, is that indeed this did occur more frequently among uh, adolescent and young males. Um, so uh, the symptoms of that, they usually occurred within a, a day or two after the second vaccine. They include chest pain and shortness of breath, um, but uh, the vast majority of those cases responded well to medicine and rest, and, 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 and they were fully recovered. Um, and again, it, this occurred in about 3.5 per million cases. Uh, it's, it's certainly something serious. If it's a symptom that you experience, you should certainly visit your doctor. But again, it's rare and treatable, and full recovery is the norm. Um, also important to mention that um, actually pericarditis and myocarditis are actually more common effects of COVID-19 itself. And that can actually be more severe if you get COVID-19. So anyway, so these are, you know, something to take seriously and to, to keep in mind and to be watchful for. Um, but again, the, the risks of, of getting um, COVID far, the risks of getting COVID far away, you know, the risks of, of, of these relatively rare or quite rare uh, side effects. Um, so that's, that's basically all I had prepared. Um, I'm happy to take any questions to the best of my ability. I'm not a virologist, uh, but uh, as anybody else in the public health department these days, I've uh, had a lot of crash courses on, uh, on, on virology lately. And so happy to do my best with any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Nicholas. That was, that was wonderful. You know, uh, as you're talking, I just remember sitting in my biochem classes at Fresno State, listening to all this, enamored by the mRNA and so on. So, yeah, thank Khan you. Khan Academy. Thank you for, yeah. Highly recommend <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, for helping us out here. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, right now, I don't believe the board members have questions, so we'll keep moving on. But I do appreciate Great. you uh, uh, you're coming on. Absolutely. Uh, I a, thank you. I have a, I have a question, um, if I could. One of the things... Yeah. One of the things that I've heard parents express concerns about is that these vaccines have only been in existence for a year or so. So we don't know the long-term implications of uh, administering these vaccines. So can, obviously you can't speak to the long-term as experienced, but what, what, if anything, would you say about, um, about the potential ramifications of this 5, 10, 20, 50 years down the road, given that we don't have a track record of that? And what should parents think about that? Yeah, no, appreciate the question. And uh, you are correct that we, you know, it's only been a year, so we don't have long-term data. Uh, what I would need to do, and I'm happy to, to look into this there, you know, there may be um, corollaries or, or, or evidence generally from the mRNA research that's been done that can suggest, you know, the possibilities of the long-term effects. I, again, I'm not an expert in mRNA virology, um, but yes, yeah, so we, you know, the short answer is no, we, you know, we don't have the long-term data yet. We're collecting it as we go. Um, but I would be happy to, yeah, prepare, for you and, and report back to you because I know I, I I heard that tonight. I mean that's 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 a concern that people have and let me let me do the best I can uh, addressing that. Hey Will, one one quick question for you. I hope um, a, 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 a number of members in our community have pointed to something that I I have read about, but I'd rather hear it from you. 
saying that the Pfizer vaccine that got approved by the FDA is not the vaccine they're giving people, so therefore it has not been approved by the FDA. I was wondering if you can provide the, uh, the, the truth behind this, uh, this claim. I, 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 I'm firstly, I got a plead ignorance on that one. I, that's a story okay. that didn't get to me. Um, perhaps it should have if I had been reading the paper that day, but yeah. I, I, yeah. It, well, I guess they, they, there's one code name for the vaccine, like Combibity or something like that. And the other one is the, F, is the Pfizer. Okay. You know, this, this is something that we'll get. Maybe we'll find somebody in the community who can write something clear and concise about this because it helps us if we can just put this information out there in simple ways. So let's add that to our. Let's our add it. Program. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. My pleasure. So, uh, board members, I'm going to go ahead and move on. So, um, so uh, this is just a summary. Uh, I, I have one quick question for the doctor. Oh, sorry, yeah. Dr. Drotty. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Nicholas. Yes. Hi. Uh, Thank you so much for um, uh, for your commitment. I know it was a long time ago that you took your Hippocratic oath, uh, but clearly uh, that's still in place. And I, I certainly appreciate uh, uh, your leadership in the uh, in the health space. So thanks so much for that. Um, I'm curious in listening to uh, comments, not just yours, but just in general with respect to challenges that youth and students face uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of facing COVID. And uh, I was just looking at some recent research from, from Yale, um, looking at uh, black and Latino youth and really seeing that they are disproportionately negatively affected um, by by COVID uh, and, and, and those complications uh, landing them in the hospital uh, with deep challenges at rates that are much higher uh, than those of, of uh, their other student peers. Um, but we don't really hear that much about that. And, um, you know, but for those populations, for Latino and Black uh, populations and parents, you know, that's something that truly is a concern to them for, for their children. And so can you speak to that a little bit about in terms of uh, perhaps a, a greater awareness uh, of, of that and, uh, and how can we continue to sort of bring uh, more resources uh, in that way to help those particular populations? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, that's really been pretty much the focus of our department since early on. We, we started seeing um, stark disparities between uh, whites and Latinos and, and Blacks early on in the pandemic. And so our focus has been on attempting to, to reduce, those, reduce those disparities. Um, certainly from early on in the adult, adult population, uh, deaths and hospitalizations uh, in LA County in particular, uh, I think were as much as about three times higher among African-Americans versus whites and, and, and twice as high among Latinos versus, um, versus whites. And um, the I'm not as familiar with the data about children, but I know that obviously by nature of having parents and grandparents who are affected, uh, Latino and Black kids are much more likely to have had a parent or grandparent die or have had a serious illness from COVID-19. COVID so just merely from the effect, the sort of psychic effect of having a sick or, 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 or dying um, family member, uh, those, those kids are very, very effective. I think there's also some, some research on um, kids becoming you know, orphans uh, because, of, because of COVID. Um, the, uh, from what I understand, the, the disparities in COVID, negative COVID, uh, COVID outcomes, you know, hospitalizations and, and, and deaths are also higher um, in, in, in youth among um, Blacks and Latinos versus, versus whites. I, I don't have the, the precise statistics on that, but um, yeah, it's the, I mean, that's really the story of, of COVID that is sort of amplified 
um, a lot of the inequities in access to care, access to insurance, um, in, in just generally the suffering of you know, underlying conditions, also more crowded housing conditions because COVID, as you know, is spread a lot through personal contact. And so um, it also has a lot to do with people's jobs and being more likely to be essential workers. Uh, you have a much higher proportion of, uh, of black and brown people working as in, you know, in supermarkets and, and, and in the fast food uh, industry and uh, in other occupations that put them at risk. So yeah, no, this, this epidemic has definitely exposed uh, some deep inequities in, in our society. And yeah, the, the kids are affected by that. So most definitely, um, uh, you know, black and Latino kids have been, have been disproportionately affected in general uh, by this pa pandemic. Yeah, you know, in many respects, it's almost like two different diseases for, you know, other populations in that way. And, and it's really clear that, you know, um, you know, COVID-19 patients that are Latino teenagers, just, so just severe, severe respiratory challenges uh, because of, of COVID. And um, that's why it's really uh, disconcerting to hear individuals say that, you know, there is no COVID, it's over and things like that. When you have, you know, Latino and black uh, youth that are, are still being, you know, deeply affected uh, by this uh, within their, uh, with their, their own their families. And so I hope that we can continue to, to ensure that, that, uh, that those folks uh, are, uh, are protected uh, moving forward, you know, as we continue to uh, combat uh, the ravages of COVID. So thank you so much again for your leadership, Dr. Nicholas. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is just give a summary uh, of uh, where we've been and then give you information so that way you can give me direction on where to go from here. So on September 22nd, the school board considered a resolution that supported a vaccine mandate for the students in SMUSD. USD. Uh, it, was, it was an item H.2 on September 22nd board meeting for those that want to go find it. The school board requested, a more, uh, and then you, uh, at that meeting, you requested uh, more information uh, from staff, which we, which we just presented. In the interim, unbeknownst to us at that time, uh, Governor Newsom made the announcement uh, we just went over regarding his interest in mandating vaccines in the state for students. So uh, right now, staff is now seeking direction on how to proceed given the information that you just received. So, uh, and so I'll just see if you guys have any questions or just leave it up to you. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Jotty. Um, I, I know this is a, a topic of, of great interest in the community that's reflected in the number of speakers that are here. Um, uh, with, with the boards okay, I think we should hear from the members of the public and then the board can in, engage in its debate uh, and discussion. So, uh, Lori, if you can introduce the speakers. I think we, should, because of the high number, I think we would do two minutes. Uh, per speaker. Right. Mr. President, how many speakers do we have on this item? Um, we have it, it, somewhere in the 20s, I think, the high 20s, and I think we'll do two minutes per, per public speaker, oh. as is our norm. Oh, there are more. Right. Mm -hmm. to... Okay. Um, the first three speakers are Wade Major. Melissa Solano, and then Joy Wilcox. My comments will not take two minutes. Last year, you polled parents repeatedly regarding school opening. This year, you've made decision after decision about the fate of our families and our children without any attempt to gather our feelings about it. Tonight, you can do the right thing and strike a blow for decency and consistency and resolve to make no more decisions related to our children and their health without first seeking our input. And when you have it, make decisions in concert with parents and tailor them for each community and each school. And here's what else you can discuss tonight. You can put to bed the rumors that Ben Allen is pulling your strings as part of a political quid pro quo. You can make reasonable accommodation to get our teachers and coaches back. The teachers and coaches, our students, have grown to love who are a part of their lives in our communities. You can defer to the state on student mandates as the law requires. You can reconsider all pandemic policies which have caused so much disenrollment and disruption in Malibu. 
you can outline clear off ramps for ending masking, testing and vaccination mandates and returning to full normal schooling. You can strictly adhere to the Public Records Act requests that we always submit without any more stalling. And you can consider differential treatment for Malibu based on its smaller student bodies, rural environment, community preference, and the very different actions by districts like LVUSD, which are comprised of sister communities to Malibu with comparable community characteristics. Please consider all of these things. They are not unreasonable. And next time you parade experts to speak to us, let's have a panel and make it a public forum so that the people with questions can address them to a panel of experts who may disagree. No more hand-picked curated experts, only at the discretion of the district. Thank you. Melissa Solano, Joy Wilcox, and then Dean Wilcox. You had an expert speak today, Dr. Nichols, and he specifically said, kids don't get hospitalized or worse from COVID. This is logical. This is not a reason to push this immunization. First off, you're, you're, you only address the FDA approvals. You fail to address the CDC required vaccine schedule. There are 10. In order to add another one, an 11th or a 12th, personal belief exemptions need to be honored, heard, and opened, okay? I'm gonna go back to what I talked about last week and that's Ubuntu. It's the essence of being human. I am because of who I am, because of who we all are. It's compassion. It's a virtue of humanity. I'm crying because my daughter has a heart murmur. And if I am pushed under duress to vaccinate her without allowing the FDA, the CDC to do their job, to collect the right data, to take that time to make sure she's gonna be okay, who is going to look at me? And you can look over to Lori all you want. Who is going to look at me if something happens to my kid? Nobody loves my kid more than me. And nobody fights as hard for all these kids than all these parents in Malibu. Okay? Like, we asked you the other day to allow SMEF funding back. Why? Because our kids have not had teeth art for two years. You denied us. You care about our kids? That's not caring about our kids. You're pushing for a vaccine mandate that really has no relevance. You're, you, you, failed, you surveyed every single thing under the sun, but yet you failed to survey parents on how we felt. And what did we all do? We rallied and we created an unbiased survey. The speaker's time is up. Thank you. Uh, Joy Wilcox, Dean Wilcox, and then Amanda Blakely. Hi, I'm Joy Wilcox, and um, we the parents demand you do not mandate the COVID vaccine for our kids. My 10-year-old twin boys were injured by their delayed 15-month 15 15 -month vaccines. One had three shots and the other who never recovered received four. Um, my, both of my boys have gene mutations and no kids in the COVID vaccine trials have had gene mutations. This I confirmed with Pfizer. Only 100% healthy kids were allowed into the trials. Um, just as Patrick Miller said earlier, um, of the 700 students in the Malibu Middle and Malibu High Schools, there's only been a couple of positive tests. Um, some of the things that are very concerning to me are that there have been 863 serious adverse reactions reported to VAERS from COVID vaccines in the kids of the 12 to 17 year old category. These include uh, myocarditis, paralysis, and death. There have been 14 deaths from the COVID vaccine in the 12 to 17 year old category, as well as 3,300 cases of myocarditis. Um, and I'm wondering why, where's this emergency to vaccinate all of our kids? In a John Hopkins study of 48,000 kids who had COVID, zero healthy kids died. 
Um, again, the, this emergency is not being reflected in the real numbers. There's only 1,250 cases or less every single day of COVID in the city of Los Angeles, a city of 9.9 .9 million people. And there's hundreds of thousands of people being tested on a weekly basis. This does not- This time is up. Uh, Dean Wilcox, Amanda Blakely, and then Laura St. John. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, can. first of all, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, there is no emergency. This thing is over. You, you, had, you had stated some facts earlier that out of 9,200 students, you said there are 32 possible infections and, and, and all of this expense and everything going forward. Anyways, we the parents demand you do not mandate the, co mandate the COVID vaccine for our kids. We, you, the school board, are not legally authorized to require this vaccine as a precondition to receiving in-person instruction. At the September 2nd, 21 board meeting, Superintendent Priority expressly acknowledged that mandatory COVID vaccination for students is not legal. By moving forward with this resolution, you are knowingly and intentionally violating a law in an, in an attempt to force a decision that must be reserved for knowledgeable experts. As expressly acknowledged by the legislature and the California Health and Safety Code, this is a decision that must be reserved for medical experts with access to all the, all the information, all the facts, not a school board. I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I don't know how you guys can bounce this stuff around the authority of, of mandating something that's illegal. It doesn't even seem logical at, at any level to me. You know, so this board is knowingly and intentionally considering, you're not violating it yet, but you guys are actually considering violating the California Health and Safety Code. Not in the middle of a global pandemic, at the very end. I don't know if you all watch college football on Saturdays, no one else around the country is wearing masks. You know, it's, it's shameful. The speaker's putting... time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Blakely, followed by Laura St. John, and then Heather Alfano. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I would like to raise concern around the childhood vaccine mandate. I myself am a vaccinated parent in Malibu. I am certainly not anti-vax, um, but I am anti-BS. I am pro-child, pro-civil liberties, pro-medical choice, pro-community, pro-family, pro-transparency and pro-accountability. I want to demand a reconsideration of the vaccine mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura St. John, Heather Alfano, and then Human Hamadi. Hi, everybody. Laura St. John here. Um, I just want to express the, that I am 100% against the mandate. I believe that there's a lot of parents that are not speaking up that feel the same way. And I believe as parents, we hold the right to be the guardian of the vision of safety and security in terms of our family's health and security, not a school board and not based on the evidence that we have. I think that there's been zero discussion. I keep bringing it up about natural immunity. Uh, I don't know where, like originally there was a discussion of herd immunity that's gone completely out the window. What about all of the students who have been exposed or have had COVID? Is there evidence that they're not at more risk reintroducing COVID through a vaccine into their systems? There's zero evidence that I can find. If anything, it's the opposite, that they're actually more protected. I don't see a lot of logic with the quarantines even, seven days, 10 days because I see siblings that are still going to school. I don't know if you guys were then tracking the siblings who are 
you know, how far are you going? So you're talking about kids who are at lunch with other kids, but then they go home and they see their siblings and their siblings are still going to school. Or maybe I'm incorrect with that, but I have not heard. Or whether they've had play dates the day before. If this was really um, hurting and killing children and we were alarmed, um, I believe that we'd be coming from more uh, guidance and trust versus fear. When I see the kids lining up and getting temperature checks and stuff in the morning, I'm wondering, you know, as a parent, with the conditions that have existed in the last year, would we really be sending our kids to school with a fever? Have you guys you know, caught our kids with fevers the way they have to show a red or green screen in the morning? It's just, to me, it's getting uh, ridiculous. Uh, what about the students who are vaccinated that you're saying can stay and, you know, and, not, and not have to be home quarantined? Isn't there evidence now that even if you're vaccinated- the speaker's time is up. Thank you. Heather Alfano, Human Hamadi, and then Alicia Peak. Hi, Heather Alfano, ICU nurse vaccinated. School board, you must defer to the state on student mandates. You are not a public health agency. How about consulting with the community that you serve for all COVID related policies like you did last year prior to reopening? Here are some facts. Less than 0.0006% of the child population in this country has died of COVID over the past two years. Less than 1% of all child deaths during that period are attributed to COVID. This is not a pandemic of our children. The COVID vaccine does not stop infection. The vaccine provides a private benefit of protection against severe disease, but it's limited on the public benefit of disease spread. So what is the argument for mandates? In the UK, COVID infection rates among the fully vaccinated are now higher than those of the unvaccinated in all age cohorts greater than 30 years old. Both vaccinated and unvaccinated people spread, which renders a mandated vaccine to attend public school unethical. What kind of world do we live in where the parents who are advocating for normalcy for their kids are considered selfish, but those who want restrictions and mandates in place so kids can protect adults are considered virtuous? The burden is always on the people suggesting the interventions to explain their reasoning. Is that If that is not part of the calculus, then the thing you're doing is not public health. Children under five are less at risk than a fully vaccinated adult, but nobody cares. It's fundamentally reality denial to mandate this vaccine. I will never again trust those who relished in the destruction of my kids' future, those who embraced discrimination as public health policy, and those who ignored the suffering of our children. There is a pediatric mental health emergency declared in this country. Let's focus on keeping our kids out of the ER for suicidal ideation instead of mandating a vaccine that should be a choice for all individuals to make with their physician. You are not a health care professional. I am. You do not love my children. The speaker's I time is up. Vote no. On Thank you. Human Hamadi, Alicia Peak, and Hamish Peterson. I'm, I'm sorry, Patterson. Hi, thank you so much, Human Hamadi. Uh, I, I wanted to, you know, uh, point something out. You've been hearing from an endless stream of parents who want us to follow science, follow reality, and not have years or decades of perpetual uh, policies in schools that really disrupt uh, education that are based on a fear of COVID. Plus, we're a little bit sick of every school board meeting basically turning into a public health forum for the last two years and counting. Uh, I acknowledge also that there will always be a vocal minority of parents who out of love for their children legitimately want to have maximal COVID precautions. I, although I disagree with them and, and think that they're scientifically and medically wrong, that's their prerogative and they love their kids. I want to say I embrace them and I think I have a solution to them. Did you mute yourself? I saw you reach forward and then you went mute. Oh, sorry about there, that. There I, I think I have a, yeah. sorry about that. I think I have a solution to this to stop this so that we can go back to education so that every parent can be happy. Just like how the House and Senate were created to satisfy both sides that wanted you know, equal representation for states and some who wanted proportional representation, so they did both. Why don't we do both? Next summer, if all of this COVID madness is gonna continue the masks and quarantines and vaccines, et cetera, we poll parents in the summer, see what proportion of kids want to be in COVID-fearing schools what proportion of kids do their parents want to be in 
schools in, in, in schools that don't acknowledge COVID anymore, that are accepting of the 0.0001% chance of death, and then split the schools. We create campuses that are back to pre-COVID, no masks, no quarantines, no nothing. The only policy, no vaccine mandates. The only policy is that if you're sick, you stay home. That's it. And then other schools that children will go into that are proportionately created based on demand that have maximal vaccination requirements, distancing, quarantine, you name it, the whole shebang. And I think if we do both, and if we split the schools within Malibu separately and within Santa Monica separately due to the geographic distances and, and have kids go to the kind of school that suits what their parents want for them, this debate is over. We'll have everyone the speaker's be happy. time is up. Uh, thank you. Alicia Peak, Hamish Patterson, and then TJ Hill. Hi, my name is Alicia Peak. I'm a teacher. I'm vaccinated, and I have three kids in the Malibu schools. There's a phrase we use in our house, and it's called stay in your lane. I just heard Drotty say that the governor only gave a press release and was not an executive order or a law. So why are we even discussing this? This is a top-down legislative thing that needs to be handled in Sacramento. Your job is to educate our kids. So we need to refocus on that. You already did a mandate on teachers before it was an executive order, which it still is not. The guidance on teachers is still vaccine or testing. But no, you continue to do both and you continue to take away amazing teachers for our children. I'm a Malibu parent who worked very hard to survey 345 parents. You have not surveyed anybody. Our findings were that two out of the three people were vaccinated, but seven out of 10 do not want in-person education tied to a vaccine mandate. It was interesting here from, to hear from Dr. Nich Nichols as your doctor, who does not even specialize in children. Mr. Coleman asked him a question about children in which he could not answer because he does not know much about children. And Dr. Kelly Andrade, teachers and principals are not happy. They are exhausted and extremely understaffed. We need to refocus this energy on education. Your job is to educate our kids. Let's talk about how EL learners are learning with a mask. They're not. How does any of these kids that are in young elementary school learn when these masks are on? They can't even see the teacher's mouths. At least if you're gonna force teachers to be vaccinated, then let them take their masks off so that kids can see their mouth. What is happening? Please do your job. Please focus on education. Let Sacramento do what Sacramento needs to do and the FDA. Thank you. Thank you. Hamish Patterson, TJ Hill, and then Maria Loya. And hello. Okay. Um, hi. Yeah, I'm absolutely against any sort of mandates here. Um, I just if I think if you listen to Dr. Nichols, he makes a very good case why you as a body would not want the responsibility of possibly harming our children. I mean, Dr. Nichols stated clearly that nobody has any knowledge what the long term effects of these vaccines will do to the children. And I just ask all of you up there, how what will you do if three, four, five, ten 10 years from now, you find out that you mandated something that has harmed these children that you're responsible for, for protecting. This mandate thing has gotten way out of control and, and you really need to focus on educating the children and providing a safe environment. Having children wearing masks, having teachers removed from their, their, these loving environments is dangerous. And, and again, please go listen to Dr. Nichols. He makes an absolutely wonderful case why you would not want to mandate anything. And ultimately, the responsibility of any damaged or hurt children from you passing a mandate falls on you, and you will have to live with that. And I highly suggest you let that decision fall upon parents who need to live with that. You do not want that karmic damage to yourself if this all goes sideways. And nobody knows if it will, and nobody knows if it won't. There is no science to say what will or won't happen with these vac vaccines long term. And if you mandate this and you damage children, that is on you. And please think twice before you do this. This is not education. You're not health professionals. 
your educators. Let's educate children and lead the health decision, the parents and doctors. It's not your responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. TJ Hill, Maria Loya, and then Harriet Fraser. Hello, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. Yes, um, so my name is TJ Hill. I'm a parent of a John Muir third grader. Um, and I have been working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic since the first days of it here in LA County. Uh, I run, I'm the executive director of an independent living center serving people with disabilities. We saw some of the first deaths uh, in the county uh, during the entire pandemic, we registered 26 people who died of COVID-19 uh, because they were high-risk individuals. Those were my friends, my colleagues, people I worked with and cared for. And here I am as a parent, all these many months later, having implemented all of the possible protocols and things for my child. My daughter's school, uh, John Muir, has, out of the nine weeks of testing, has subjected five different quarantines of 10-day quarantines to, out of the nine weeks of testing, five different quarantines uh, for, for children that have missed school for those 10-day periods. It is, the, the quarantine procedures are, disproportionate and they're hurting our children. When you look at this, this group of the sixth graders that everyone is talking about, that, they, that this is the group we're gonna try to implement first, that if you are educators and going by the education data, we know disproportionately the damage being caused is to the younger children. Those in the early grades are having the greater psychological and educational damage not the older grades because they can study independently. When my daughter has gone on her at-home study, it has been, it is, speakers it has been. Up. Thank you. Um, for those of you who aren't finished making, when you wanna make more comments, I know for instance, this previous speaker has emailed us before and I just wanna remind everyone that you can, if you have more to say, you can always email the board and the board will read your emails. Um, Maria Loya, then Harriet Fraser, and then Heather Gardner. Good evening. Um, I would like to speak against the COVID vaccine mandate. The COVID vaccine mandate creates a false sense of security. The fact is that both vaccinated and unvaccinated can contract and transmit the virus. However, this fact continues to be ignored. The PCR test and the COVID vaccine are both still under emergency use authorization. The COVID vaccine is an experimental vaccine that uses new uh, mRNA technology. According to the Nuremberg Code, it is illegal to require people and children to take a vaccine or administer a medical procedure in exchange for jobs, services, or public education. The Nuremberg Code reads, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him or her to make an understanding and enlightened decision. This latter element requires that before the acceptance of an affirmative decision by the experimental subject, there should be made known to him or her the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment the method and means by which it is to be conducted, all the inconveniences and hazards reasonably to be expected and the effects upon his or her health or person which may possibly come from his part or her participation in the experiment. The duty and responsibility for ascertaining the quality of the consent rest upon each individual or who initiates, directs, or engages in the experiment. It is a personal duty the speaker's and time is up. which may not be delegated to another. 
Uh, thank you, Harriet Fraser, Heather Gardner, and then Marnie Kamens. Hi, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that there are unprecedented staffing difficulties all over the state right now and that this is not an easy situation. However, I feel strongly that we should be working as hard as possible to roll out the in-school quarantine for elementary school students as soon as possible. The CDC are at present doing test to stay schemes with many school districts and generally they are finding that 97% of students never get the virus from the contact with the positive case, which correlates to 97% of students being able to stay at school rather than be sent home with the whole cohort or class. We know overwhelmingly from studies through distance learning that in-class instruction is far more efficient and effective. And although I understand the logistics are complicated and difficult, other school districts are managing this and we must not be overwhelmed by it. Get them tested twice a week, check for symptoms daily and keep them at school. This is far preferable. The testing is now going smoothly, we're hearing, just adding in an extra test for those students in a class where the case does not seem unsurmountable. I appreciate the LACDPH adopting this modified in-school quarantine following the CDC recommendations and the California Public Health Guidelines, and they did this to keep students in class. I urge you to adopt this for elementary school students as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Heather Gardner, Marnie Kamens, Claudia Bautista Nicholas. Hi, how are you all tonight? Um, thank you for giving me time to speak. Um, I am a vaccinated mother of two from the Malibu schools. And I am also a credentialed teacher who is actually subbing right now in the Malibu schools. Um, so I come in contact with um, high school, middle school, and elementary kids at a regular basis. Um, as I said, I am vaccinated. My husband is vaccinated. My son is 12 years old and is coming to the point where he might have to get a vaccination. And um, basically where I'm coming from and where a lot of people in this community are coming from is that um, I do not support these mandates for the vaccines um, for adults or children. I know we're talking about children right now, but we are seeing a dramatic impact on our society from people who are being forced to resign or who are being fired, um, teachers and nurses at the school, which at Malibu Elementary, the principal just told me the other day, he doesn't even have enough time to sit in his office to do what he's supposed to do. He's out wandering around all day. He doesn't even have time to do what he's supposed to be doing as a principal because he's trying to get volunteers to come in to, to parents to volunteer to come and do what the teachers are supposed to be doing that were resigning or were fired. Um, we as Americans have basic freedoms that are guaranteed to us in the United States Constitution. I used to be a history teacher for eight and a half years at Malibu High School. And basically we all know these, we should review these because the things that are happening in our country, the things that are happening in the district and what our Newsom is asking us to do is extremely anti-American. And I understand that people who are vaccinated want, think that this will all make everything better if everyone just gets vaccinated, but forcing people telling people that they do not have the right to assemble in certain places, restricting, which is what is going to happen. The LA is going to do on November 4th. The speaker's time is up. Access. Thank you. Marnie Kamens, Claudia Bautista Nicholas, and then Kimberly Ford. Hi, thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm a Malibu mom. I have a six-year-old at Webster Elementary School in kindergarten. Uh, in, in Malibu. I, I, I'm listening to all these people thanking the people on the board and thank you for this and thank you for that. And I kind of am in disbelief because I don't want to thank you for anything. I feel like you guys are a bunch of followers that aren't doing what's best for our children, that aren't doing what I would hope you know in your heart is best. If you look at the research and you look at anything that's out there, children are not dying of COVID. So more children are dying of the flu, more children are dying of mental health disorders, more children are dying of suicide, and you're mandating us to do this experimental vaccine that hasn't been around for years on our little children, and 
if they get sick, 10 years, 20 years, you guys are going to be gone or you're going to be in your cushy jobs. You're a bunch of cowards in my mind. You're a bunch of cowards doing what you think you want to do to hire your, to better yourselves. You're not doing what's best for children. I feel stupid even talking here because I don't think you're going to listen to what any of these passionate speakers have spoken up about people whose children, whose blood is on the line. And you guys are just going to sit up there and vote. And it doesn't matter what we say. And that's sad because we are your real constituents, not not the other people in, in politics. Um, the real state of emergency happening right now, there were just in October 20th, American Association of Child Psychiatrists and Adolescent Psychiatrists, the Children's Hospital Association, they declared a state of emergency in mental health for children because there are so many children with disorders, anxiety disorders, trauma, disorders from being isolated, disorders from being abused alone at home during this time. And you guys are just busy talking about this, vaccines. This time is up. Thank you. Claudia Batista Nicholas, followed by Kimberly Ford and then Kim Ebling. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm coming to you today as um, a parent. Um, I have, I'm a parent of two SMMUSD students. They're both fully vaccinated. I am a teacher and I'm fully vaccinated. And I also wanted to tell you that I represent the teacher body and we're proud that almost all of us are fully vaccinated now. Um, yes, there were a few that did not get vaccinated, but the reason that we as CTA stand for vaccines, and these are all of our teachers, uh, it's because we want kids to be in school. We want to be there with them, teaching them. And the best, the game changer for us was the vaccine. Um, so we are thrilled that we see charts like the one that uh, Nurse Rachel and Nurse Barrett showed us that kids are able to stay at home. I also wanted to speak to the, the comment that this isn't a emergency. Just so you know, um, nationally, 25% of all COVID cases are children under 17. Yet they are only 22.2% of the US population. Now I love my son. And if I could put all three of the vaccines, I would put them on him because I wanna make sure that he stays safe and healthy. And I know that you have a tough decision to make, but I hope that you know that so many of us, I mean, 83.7% I think it was 83 of our district kids are already vaccinated. And there is a silent majority that is in support of vaccines and definitely of the masking because the masking is what's keeping us so healthy and the testing is what's making us sure that we don't infect other kids when some come up uh, ill. And just so you know, the only cases that we have seen as Nurse Barrett has told you eloquently and many times are kids that play sports because they play sports without, without their the mask. Time is up. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Ford, followed by Kim Ebling, and then Doroka Monty. Hi, uh, Kimberly Ford here. I am a mother of a first grade and fourth grade student att mm -hmm. attending Malibu Elementary School. First off, I would like to start by saying I'm vaccinated and I am not anti-vax, but I am anti-mandate. Also, I would argue that the previous speaker, I would say there's not a silent majority in favor of masking and this vaccine mandate, I would say it might be a silent minority. Um, also, I asked why are we trying to vaccinate our youth who are the least vulnerable and the least likely to spread COVID-19? Our children are the least likely group to suffer serious illness from COVID-19 but they are the most susceptible to incurring side effects from the vaccine. We are moving in the wrong direction. COVID numbers are dropping. We should be discussing reducing COVID restrictions on our children, not implementing this vaccine mandate. Additionally, 
the CDC needs to add this to their list of mandatory vaccines and allow personal exemptions. I don't see this discussed. Why are we mandating a vaccine prior to having it listed as mandatory under the CDC? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Kim Ebling, Daroka uh, Monti, and Giovanni Ramirez. Well, actually, I'm, and I, on Giovanni Ramirez, it's not clear, but it appears that he meant to sign up for this. It says item one, but we, there is no item one, so we're thinking it's G1. Okay, if you can't get a response, let's move to the next person, please. Hello. Hi, yes, this go is ahead. Deroyka. Hi, this is Deroyka Monti. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm 100% against the mandates of the vaccines and against all mandates, really, because this is supposed to be a free country. And I don't know what's happened, but it seems like it's really not anymore. Um, it's a fundamental right for us to have the right of what goes into our bodies. Uh, that's just a, <clears throat> that's a complete basic right of uh, bodily autonomy. Um, and it's the board's obligation to answer to the parents. And as, you, as we could see here, the majority is overwhelmingly parents that do not want mandates. Um, we need to focus on education. This is a school, not a hospital. So we need to bring the teachers back and the coaches back. And um, I mean, you guys have to remember that we voted you in and we could also vote you out. So you should please do not vote for the mandatory vaccines or any, any mandates. We need to get rid of mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Giovanni Ramirez, Sarah Rodriguez, and then Lydia Moraro. I don't see a Giovanni. Let me look for Sarah Rodriguez. Good evening. So I'm compelled to begin my comments by circling back to board member Foster's comment at a previous meeting in which he drew a comparison between vaccine mandates for students and the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Mr. Foster, in drawing such a parallel, you've engaged in specious and fallacious reasoning using whataboutism and false analogy. What's more, your comments oversimplify the issues involved in both policy decisions and gloss over the racist basis of Japanese internment. It was inappropriate for you to use the racist policy of forced relocation and removal of Jap Japanese American people as a rhetorical weapon in support of your anti-mandate position, a policy position which would likely exacerbate rather than ameliorate existing race-based health disparities. Japanese American communities in Santa Monica and West LA were deeply traumatized by this racist policy. As educators and representatives of this district, we owe more to our community, including the descendants of those impacted by forced relocation and internment, some of whom are our students, my students. Japanese internment was a policy based in racism and greed as much as irrational fear and paranoia. Not so the vaccine mandate up for discussion today. The vaccine mandate you are contemplating is based on rational public health concerns, scientific evidence and recommendations, and the desire to protect everybody's health from an illness that has disproportionately negative impacts on communities of color. I'd ask you, Mr. Foster, to repair the harm by acknowledging that this portion of your comments were ill-considered and inappropriate. As educators, we know better and we should do better. To that end, thank you um, to district administrators for directing and implement, implementing practices um, that are keeping our students and staff safe, allowing us to remain in in-person schooling with the fewest possible disruptions, which is most certainly in the best interest of our students' mental and academic well-being. I trust you'll continue to implement these policies as long as they continue to be recommended or mandated by our local and national public health bodies. Furthermore, I'm pleased that most of our board members seem supportive of a vaccine mandate for students once such vaccines are fully approved by the FDA. Whether or not you move ahead before the state of California the takes speaker's action, time is up. I urge you to lobby the governor and Senate to add COVID-19. Thank you. 
Um, Lydia Moraro, Michael Sparks, and then Heather Pitts. Good evening. Um, I really appreciate the comments of the last speaker, even though she couldn't finish, um, and also the comments of uh, Claudia Bautista. Um, I've heard a lot of things tonight, and I have to say my kids were um, in the room and I was listening out loud to the meeting and they were like, what? What are these people saying? Why are they saying that? The kids, they want to stay safe. They want to see the end of this nightmare. And they are appreciative, and so am I, of the masks, the staff vaccination, the testing, the filters, the increase in air exchanges, the increase in gender air services, the nursing staff, the consulting with medical professionals. It's, is it all deployed perfectly? No, but, but the efforts from all involved um, at the board and from the staff are noted and they are really important. I'm grateful and trust me, I'm highly critical character. I'm sure all of you know, but I am very grateful for this district's work to keep us safe, to keep the, keep the kids safe. In particular, on a micro move, I would like to thank Dr. Shelton and Ms. Kamlos and Mr. Whaley for closely monitoring and supporting the transition of choir and wind players indoors, um, all fully masked and you know, I, I have kids that play with instruments and it made me very nervous with the COVID vaccine, but I'm not nervous. I'm sleeping at night because of you guys' efforts. Um, um, lastly, I must say, I really can't get behind the many parents I've heard this evening stating that the pandemic is over and that masks are depriving people from oxygen. I think I'm going to go crazy if I hear one more time that people are deprived from oxygen if they're gonna wear a mask. It, I would like these folks to realize that if they go so far as feeling that the pandemic is over, it is only because the district, city, and county's effort to mitigate this devastating effects of the COVID-19. So um, the California State PTA supports the use of vaccine to protect the health and safety of the children and families across California. PTA is us, Parent Teacher Association. That's us. California, Speaker's uh, time is up. Okay. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, Michael Sparks and then Heather Pitts. Go ahead, Heather. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I was in Maryland last week where I have family and I also have a home. I also own a home in Malibu. Interestingly, California and Maryland have two of the lowest spread rates in the nation. They're constantly the same color on the CDC's maps. Also interesting in Maryland, there is no state of emergency, no testing in schools, no quarantines putting entire classes out, no teachers being fired, no masking outdoor, and no vaccine mandates, none of it. This is all garbage, pardon the term, created by you all. It's all political and we all know it. It's the same virus with the same variants and the same vaccines. And yet these two street states can treat this completely differently. You may ask why? Well, Maryland has a Republican governor and California has a Democratic governor. You need to stop being political puppets and mouthpieces and start doing what is right. People all over in the nation are in football stadiums and at concerts without mask on, having a great old time. And yet my son has a rag strapped to his face to the point that he can't breathe. Yes, to the prior speaker, he can't breathe. And I'm sorry if that drives you crazy. It's a fact. My nine-year-old just wants to go outside and run and play with his friends and breathe at recess. But you all won't allow him. And I have had enough. I just had to fight with the school at Webster to be permitted to see my son at a Halloween parade. Because at the direction of you all, only those who were quote unquote, and I have the email, permitted and selected would be able to come see the children in the Halloween parade. You all sound like lunatic dictators. If you mandate this vaccine, then it's quite simple. We will leave. Some of us have the ability to leave and we all know that you all do not care 
about that and you don't care about what happens to Malibu residents in general. And for all of those concerned about what the lady just said, I'd like to actually thank Craig Falls. The speaker's time is up. Thank you. Sarah, could you just check on the two that, uh, I guess there are three, Kim Ebling, Giovanni Ramirez, and then Michael Sparks. And that one. So are the other, I mean, we do have a number of people who signed up for general public comment, and I don't have any idea whether they really meant to talk on this or that, but. Again, make sure your um, Zoom profile name matches the name you signed up with. Hey, Lori, would it be right if I imagine that all COVID-related comments would be appropriately made under this item, that this is broad enough so that general public comment is probably a, um, uh, about anything but this? You are correct, Craig. Yeah, Craig, I actually, that is exactly what I was thinking. I just don't know how to determine when people signed up well, yeah, for general so public I, comments, whether they really meant something that other, because I agree. I, I mean, so, that- So maybe we just <laughs> say that. Maybe we say, hey, if you signed up for general public comment, thinking you wanted to say something about COVID, we need to somehow have a way to know that what you really wanted. So how do we know, I guess, do they raise their hand or how do we figure out that they're- That's what I'm trying to figure out. A lot out. of the people were, were double listed. So yeah. that, that takes care of a, a good number of them. But not all. Yeah. But not all. But, but not yes, all. I agree. I'm trying to look through yeah, the I, lists here. <laughs> um, I, you know, I could read through the list. I mean, I'm, I am in agreement with what you're getting at, Craig. Um, maybe I could read the list of people signed up for general public comments. And if those people comments have to do with Ben's COVID report, which is basically all of the things in play in the district at this point, um, let's have you speak now. And if the public comment is on something different than that, we'll wait on you for after we discuss this item. So I'm gonna read the rest of the names here three at a time, Angela D. Gaetano, Diana Henick, and Jane Rainsford. And it, actually, if you, if you already spoke and you're doubled up here, I'll assume that, um, well, oh, okay, let's do that. Hello, I'm Kim Ebeling. Sorry for botching your name, Evelyn. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, that's okay. You got it right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, you know, I just want to say that I do oppose the vaccine mandate against our kids. And, you know, the reason why is that I think we need more time. I don't think that I, I'm pro-vaccine. I'm vaccinated. The second I was able to get vaccinated, I did. Um, I apologize. My dog is making noises in the background. Um, but... You know, my husband got the pericarditis, myocarditis, and was hospitalized for three days. That was really hard to watch and to have to share with our kids. Like, Daddy was in the hospital, and we don't know what's going on. And we think he's having heart attacks, and he's a healthy, you know, young man, and has never had any issues before. So I share this because I think it's really important for us to be able to understand more information um, and, and to have some time for our kids to be able to really understand what's going on before we move forward and put a blanket statement that everybody has to be vaccinated. I also want to say that I speak out on behalf of the African-American community. I have African-American um, nephews and nieces and they are more nervous about the vaccine than I am as a white woman. And so I have to recognize that there are other people in the community that do not share the same luxuries that I have in life and have been put into different situations. And so specifically when I think of our coach and coach Daryl not being ready to be vaccinated, like I think we need to have more empathy and sympathy for people in different situations. So I just wanna say that um, 
I, I really appreciate you guys listening to this. Sorry about my dog. Um, but I think that we need to have, um, a, a moment, a pause, and just not say that blanket, like every kid needs to be vaccinated right now. The numbers are low. And I urge you to share more information with us about how and why this is so important to be done right now when there's not a mandate across the board. And I want to know more information about why we're the doing speakers it and why we it's necessary at this point. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, okay, so yes, Sarah, we're going to go to the list of general public comments. And if I call your name and your comment is on COVID-19, um, yeah, this, okay, well, we're, we're not speaking. All right. What we want to be clear about is if you want to speak about COVID-19 issues in the district, which Dr. Drotty just gave a long report on and which the board is going to discuss, you may speak now, but that means you will not have an opportunity to speak in general public comments. And we'll consider that you intended to speak now. Hopefully that's clear. So um, let's then take people three at a time. Angela D. Gaetano, Di Diana Henick, Jane Rainsford. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm just going to assume you can. Um, thanks for hearing us again. Hopefully it makes an impact today. Um, you know, I couldn't help but think that these board meetings are really starting to feel like I'm watching someone perform the latest TikTok dance in public. It's almost like there's no shame left anymore. Um, aren't you ashamed that we're still standing around talking about COVID and that we're obsessing over um, a medical decision that you have no right to take part in. Uh, why are we one of the only districts in the country discussing young children being mandated to get the shot that is still an EAU product? Um, isn't anybody embarrassed or doesn't anybody want to move on and talk about education? Um, why does nobody pay any attention to the fact that you're still playing doctor nine weeks later? People are jumping ship. People are leaving the district. This is all complete insanity. Um, I'd like to also point out that nobody on this board has kids in the district. That's like me showing up at the French Laundry and demanding a job as the chef. It makes absolutely no sense. I implore you to rethink this. Please open your ears and your hearts and hear our pleas. There's still time left to do the right thing. It's time to be on the right side of history. Please listen and you can do it. You can make a different choice. Also, I'd like to ask um, that Ms. Bautista Nicholas, can you please provide the data, the actual numbers that the masks are making a difference um, for the COVID spread? And it's not just a virus being a virus and um, finding its end naturally. Um, I implore you to hear us and please don't discount us. Thank you so much. Uh, John, Diana, John, Hinek, John, Richard. Yeah, sorry about that. I know we have a practice of not um, jumping in after um, public speakers, um, but I am compelled. Um, I have heard over and over again from speakers that there is nobody on this board that has the child in the district. And you can tell that my voice is upset and I moved, uh, I'm upset about this. I put two children through this district for 20 consecutive years, as has every member of this board. And I just need to say that. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, Diana Henick, uh, Jane Rainsford, and then uh, Heather Alfano, but you already spoke and it says you wanted to talk about COVID. So Heather is done. Diana, Jane Rainsford, then Chevy Baruch. Good evening, uh, members of the board and all parents listening tonight. Uh, my concerns are specifically regarding your lack of communication and the assumption that it's okay to call us domestic terrorists whenever we voice our concerns. You do not own oh our God. children. You do not have the legal authority to decide about the health of our children. Testing and masks have been approved by the FDA for emergency use only, which we are no longer. 
the cycle threshold of PCR test is 99% false positive. Let me ask you, Smash and John Muir share a campus. How is it possible that since September, John Muir is reporting weekly positives and Smash has at zero? Why are you not taking, talking about the threshold of herd immunity or the 99.98% survival rate in children? The 21USD360BBB statute lays out every single requirement of, for any drug or any device that is investigational, and it states that any citizen must be informed to accept or reject such drug and or device. There is no such a thing as an approved COVID-19 vaccine in the US. The FDA granted to sell and manufacture Comoranti vaccine, but it does not exist here in the US under the emergency use authorization. Stop acting as if you have the legal authority to dictate the health of our children. Have you tried wearing a mask for seven hours straight with no break? Why are you not polling the parents? Why aren't you being transparent about how long our children will have to wear a mask? What are your ramp of policies? Are you being pressured by Senator Ben Allen? How much money is the government promising you to mandate these COVID policies at the cost of our children, emotional, mental, and physical health? Taking things away from our children until we say yes is not choice. So who are the terrorists now? Thank you. Uh, Jean Rainsford, Chevy Baruch. Um, it, uh, she spoke, I think, on another item. Hello, thank you. I object to San SMUSD's adoption of mandates that discriminate. Discrimination in its ugliest form is being exercised by Santa Monica School Board. The school board won't honor and uphold people's sincerely held religious beliefs, their personal beliefs, or their medical exemptions. This is what discrimination looks like and I find it hard to believe that only one board member, Craig Foster, is vocally uncomfortable with this. Why are not all of you speaking up? We need you to speak up for us. So in SMUSD, we are losing members of staff and all because the board won't be human, won't sit down and talk, won't make reasonable accommodations. Dr. Mark Kelly, head of HR, I can only imagine must be having sleepless nights as he fires yet another teacher in our district for not wanting the jab. Before October the 1st, Coach Darrell had been teaching for 14 years at Webster School in Malibu. He has two young children, a wife, and is a cherished member of the Malibu community. And now after this arbitrary date, he is no longer allowed on campus, he is stripped of his income and his job, and is regarded as less than all because he hasn't taken the jab. This is what discrimination looks like. It's wrong, it's immoral, it's illegal. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have 80 young male athletes at Samuel High sitting in the school cafeteria twice a week with their masks on, all because their exceptional soccer coach, Paul Spacey was fired. A coach that spends all of his time outside in the fresh air and all because sincerely held beliefs were rejected and reasonable accommodations were refused. Can you see the absurdity in this? This is what discrimination looks like. I object to SMUSD's adoptions of mandates that discriminate. Please make accommodations for those members of our community. The speaker's time is not up. To take a medicine that does not stop you from transmitting or Thank you. Chevy Baruch, Sandra Luban, and then Annika Evans. Hi, um, I was thinking a lot about what I have to say today. Um, and I wanted to actually say that uh, I always look at board members and I'm a board member in a synagogue um, as people that can see beyond their own personal view. Someone that can see what other people might be able. And that's what put you in that chair. It puts you there because you are and proved prior to you being elected that you are able to see more than one point of view. I wanna apologize. I wanna apologize because until today, I believe that 
most of you are not able to see any point of view beside yourselves. And today I listened carefully. I looked at you and I looked at the face and I listened to the small comments from different members of the board. And I wanna say that today I believe that there is a chance that all of you are able to listen and see that there are other points of view. And like in every democratic country, we all allow to have our own points of views. I wanted to speak about the fact that I am to the point that I'm so unbelievably frustrated from what's going on in our schools. That at the end of this month, I'm taking out both of my girls because I don't think that a school that I don't trust, teachers that I don't trust, because they speak in and advocating for a vaccine. Because so many military-like procedures and policies are being implemented without even being for a moment stopping and saying, the speaker's time is up. Thank you. Sandra Lubon, Annika Evans, and then Erica Leslie. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can you Go hear ahead. Me? Yes. Okay. Um, I understand that it is your responsibility to keep children safe and mitigate disease. I can understand your perspective, but I just want you to understand that the vaccine is not the magical solution. If you heard that Duke University, the most vaccinated university in the United States, just had 400 COVID cases. Of the 400, eight were unvaccinated. So that's just proof right there that if you vaccinated the entire Santa Monica Malibu School District, that would not stop transmission. Dr. Drotty knows as he had his own breakthrough case. We all know this. So I understand that there's people that want to vaccinate their children. That's fine. They should be allowed to, but we should be respected. Southwest Airlines, um, in and out Burger, you know, Navy, military, all military officials, doctors, lawyers, um, firemen, policemen, they're all standing up. There's are millions of people in the United States. It's not just this little Santa Monica crowd. There's millions of people that do not want this, okay? The US has had a history of experimental vaccines in South America and Africa. I'm sure you've heard of these and they went bad. Lots of people got sick and died. And this is still an experiment. These are our children. It, you know, this is deep to our hearts. So we need you to have some compassion. Can we break through to your hearts? Dr. Adrati, we're talking. Are you even listening to us? I mean, three years from now, what if lots of children die? What are you guys gonna say? That's gonna be on your conscience because you're making this decision. This is an experimental vaccine. It does not stop COVID. It does not stop COVID. I repeat, it does not stop COVID. The speaker's COVID. time is up. Thank you. Um, Annika Evans, Erica Leslie, then Alexandra Ellis. Hello. So this vaccine is not at all safe and effective. Uh, as we can hear, a lot of moms already know that out there. Uh, but it doesn't seem like you pay much attention to it. If this vaccine really worked, I don't think we would need to wear a mask and I don't think we would need to test. So why are all those things still implemented? If you think that your vaccine is safe, why are you in the board sitting there with masks next to each other? As soon as you walk out of there, I'm sure most of you go to a restaurant with your colleagues and other friends and you do not wear a mask. So what is the difference? You know, you vaccinated. Why do you still wear a mask? Why vaccinate if it's not safe? Why vaccinate if it's not effective? You know, why take a vaccine if I still can get COVID? I'd rather take the chance of getting the real COVID than getting the vaccine. I have a friend that had the Pfizer vaccine. He's ended up in the ER two days later, and I don't know if he's going to be living. I don't know anyone that had any effect from COVID, but I do know people that got affected from the vaccine. I have my belief. You think you're going to get hurt from COVID? 
I think we're going to get hurt from the vaccines. And we don't even know what happens down the road, like many people have pointed out too. Why are you not hearing us? What make you or give you the right to demand what's going to happen to my health? I can advocate for myself and my own children. You do not need to tell us what to do. This is my body. This is my children's bodies. And you have no right to tell them to do something that I know can be harmful to them. Just like I can tell you to not take the vaccine because you're afraid of COVID. You can take your vaccine, but we are not. Okay. I'm more afraid of the vaccine because it's something that doesn't belong in my body. I know I can fight off a bacteria virus. So maybe we need to educate how to stay healthy, how to have a good diet, how to have the right supplements, it's but you don't even mention. Uh, Erica Leslie, Alexandra Ellis, and then Kimberly Prescott Brady. Can I speak now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. This is very hard. Um, this is hard for everybody. We're all angry. We're all scared. We're all upset. Our enemy is COVID. It's not these people at this board. This came down from the state. You want to be mad about a mandate? Take it to the state. Take it to the Senate. It, your fight's not here. So, you know, whatever letters you have to write, fine, write them. But we need to come together. We're all human beings. We're just trying not to die. We're trying to go back to life how it was before. And we're all exasperated at this point. We want our children to be healthy and happy. This is not where, I mean, we're fighting over something that we have no control over. These people at this board have no control over what the state mandates. This is a mandate. Regardless of whether they say it's a press release, a mandate, the governor said it. Not anybody sitting in these seats. The discussion has to be had. We have to make sure the kids are safe. When they do go to school, and what are we going to do when they go home? We just have, it's just the end of it. It's frustrating. I'm mad too, but these are my, our enemies. COVID is. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Alexandra Ellis, Kimberly Prescott Brady. And those are the final comments. Dear white liberal, 28% of black Americans aged 18 to 44 years old are vaccinated in New York, meaning the vaccine passports deny over 72% of the black community their services. Since you think voter ID is racist, you must surely think that vaccine passports are as well, but you don't. Instead, you want to demonize everyone who refuses the COVID-19 vaccine. So let me tell you exactly why the black community is the most resistant to this vaccine. Let's go back to a time when the government decided that the blacks would be used as guinea pigs without their knowledge. From 1932 to 1972, the government conducted the infamous Tuskegee experiment on black men in an attempt to understand the effects of syphilis. Participants were told that they were being treated white liberals seem to think that they know what's best for us the truth is black americans have authority over our own bodies not you we're tired of being controlled manipulated and lied to the bottom line is this we truly won't know the effects of this vaccine for at least a few years after all that we've been through we are allowed to be skeptical so my question to you white liberals is why are you applauding forced vaccinations on those who don't trust it on those who come from a lineage of trauma due to dark history i thought black lives matter Okay, um, Kimberly Pre Prescott Brady. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm pro-vax, um, but I'm anti-mandate. I have the COVID vaccine myself, my husband does, but I cannot give it to my children because I have what's called pericarditis, which is inflammation of the sac around your heart, which is also a very serious side effect that we all know that is happening 
to people, pericarditis, both carditis, myo and pericarditis. I've been told by cardiologists, uh, pediatricians, they all support me and say that my fears, worries are valid. It's valid because it, my children could have a proclivity to this horrible inflammation of the heart already, and this vaccine could give it to them. So you guys are gonna mandate something that can harm my children, give them a chronic heart condition. I mean, you please, please listen to us tonight, story after story. I mean, I'm pro-vax. I, my situation has gotten worse since I've gotten vaxxed, but guess what? People my age have been dying of COVID. So I would take the vax again. Children are not dying of COVID. So my choice is give them a vax that could give them a lifelong a chronic and painful heart problem to stay in school, to get educated, or take a risk at letting them to get COVID and just get a flu-like symptoms. It's, it's ridiculous we're even talking about this. You guys should be talking about their education. They've suffered enough. Please, please, I beg of you, do not push this mandate. It's, it's, it's unlawful. And uh, nobody, everyone I know around me, hundreds and hundreds of people are pro-choice. Even my friends who've gotten their children vaccine, vaccinated already. Please, please, please consider and listen to us tonight. Thank you. That concludes the comments. So we won't have any public comments because that took care of everyone who had signed up. So thank you, Craig, for the suggestion because I <laughs> was thinking similarly. Okay, so it is uh, 927. The, the conversation of the board right now is to provide direction to Dr. Drotty on uh, his COVID report. So we, we spoke a little bit already about different quarantines. We definitely need to give uh, staff direction on how we feel concerning uh, the governor's press release and potential vaccine mandates. So I think we should just maybe take a, a, a turn through the board and people can speak to what they want to remark to in Dr. Jotty's report and their feelings and, and give their personal direction uh, regarding the mandates uh, and looking forward. So does anybody want to jump off and go first? No, I don't I don't want to go first, except that I want to clarify one thing, which I only learned about tonight about the governor's announcement. If I could yeah. add that in the conversation, because I think it might. I don't know if it'll make a difference to anyone, but I Can you thought, do that now, Lori. Yeah. And then I don't need to be the one who goes first overall. But um, what I had understood was exactly what Dr. Drotty described, at, at, which was that the governor made an announcement and that's all it is. No executive order, nothing, uh, no impact. But I received an email, um, I don't know, just as the meeting was starting, which shared with me a um, something from the CDE website, um, which I don't know how to even, share this with all of you eventually, but I will, but um, uh, which basically says that the governor's announcement has, I, I don't think it's interpreted. I think he gave direction to the California Department of Public Health. To, this is gonna be my paraphrase, but to begin, um, the process of adding the vaccine, the COVID vaccine um, to the list of mandated vaccines in accordance with the way he laid out that the term following the um, grade level span approved for permanent authorization by the FDA, that thing. <laughs> um, what is not clear, and I, again, I, I can, I don't know how to share this and I'm not even on the screen with all of you. So I really don't know how, but I'll, I can share it all with you later or give it to Sarah and have her share it. But effectively what's not clear. So what I think is clear is that the governor did more, it seems, than he didn't do an executive order. That's true. He can't act for the legislature and he didn't call them into session. That's true. Um, 
But what he did do apparently is give direction to the State Department of Public Health. What is unclear is the timeline that they're acting under and whether, for instance, if there were permanent authorization given to a vaccine for children over 12 um, before the first of the year, before the next term starts, whether they would have been even able to complete the process that they go through, because I don't know what the process is, and that's not clear <laughs> from their website either. So um, we all obviously have to find out more about that, but I think I sort of this demonstrates the lack of clarity to everyone because Dr. Grady got his information from lawyers. Um, all of us have been scraping around to try to figure out what in fact was the import of what the governor did because it seemed like a lot and then it seemed like nothing. So now I think it seems like something, but <laughs> it's still not clear what the timeline will be. And what also is clear on this website is that it would include a personal exemption. Um, so again, that would have to be changed. If, if this, what the governor directed were to happen through the Department of Public Health for something to be different than that, the legislature would have to act. Um, so I, not, not to confuse things any more than they're already confused, but I, I really, I felt like since at least I have that in my head, I wanted to share that with everyone. Yeah, that didn't muddy the waters at all. <laughs> I mean, it just shows you what we're, I mean, what, what's happening right now with the, the, the type of direction, the type of information that we're getting from the different entities. Um, anyway, who, who wants to jump in? If no one wants to jump in, I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus first. Uh, you guys need to stop talking next to me, please. All right, thank you. Okay, I, I will speak first. One is it's clear it's clear that the governor has indicated that we are, as a state, we are moving towards mandatory vaccinations. How, when, where is, is, is not defined, but we are moving toward there. Um, I am curious um, what will happen um, to the people who have been so opposed to a mandate foisted on them by the board. What will happen when that mandate becomes foisted on them by the state legislator at the urging of the governor? Are we still gonna have the same resistance or is the issue that the school board is putting itself out there first as opposed to our state assembly? Um, I don't know the answer to that. We'll have to, we'll have to see how that plays out. The first thing I do wanna say, uh, one thing that I've learned in my uh, personal work is that when people feel fear or anxiety, um, it's real. So I, I just wanna to say to the people who, there are many people who spoke to who I disagree with almost at a complete polar end, but I accept, I accept the truth of what you're saying. Your emotions are true to you. I, I accept that. I understand that your concerns are real. Your fear is real. No one is trying to deny your feelings. At least I'm not trying to do that. I'm accepting the feelings, but I'm also accepting my responsibility as a board member which has me looking after 9,500 or so students, 1,500 employees. It's 11,000 people. We heard from 30 tonight. So for me, I look at our community. I see our high school kids and SAMO 85% vaccinated. I see our Malibu students at about 66%, but I think that number's wrong because I think, there's, I think it's a higher number based on uh, misconceptions on population. Um, I see our middle schools bringing those numbers up. That's the survey. 99% of our families are accepting the testing protocols. That's the survey. 99% of our teachers are vaccinated. They, they've made their voices loud and clear with their actions. So if people want to see another survey in the next two weeks, I am open to that. But I, I think that our community, by and large, has voiced their opinions through their actions. Um, I don't want to discount the, the voices we've heard today. I want to recognize that, but I do want to recognize the thousands of people who have taken actions that they believe is in the best interests of our school district. As for what we should do, I, I, I do believe we need to hew to the, what the governor said. Um, my feeling would be we would do something 
12 and up as soon as the emergency youth authorization is lifted. If it happens in November 1st, then I think we could do something 60 days later. If it happened January 1st, we could do something March 1st. I think there's about a 60 day period we would need to, to, to do that. Although most of those students have been vaccinated and I think many families will avail themselves of it. So my feeling is that I do not feel there's any point of, of, of approving a vaccine mandate that has a personal exemption. It just doesn't make sense to me, then it's not a mandate. So I do not wanna to fight to push something through if it has a personal exemption attached to it. Um, that's my feeling on that. I would like to point out that our neighboring private schools, I'll point to Crossroads, Harvard, Westlake, Brentwood, Windward, uh, Marlboro, New and New Roads, all have 12 and up vaccine mandates right now and testing and masks. So the communities that have more freedom to act as they wish um, have, have taken this step. Um, and the last data that I'll give you is from what Lori pointed out that we'll have to get up online. California educates 12% of the students in the nation. California schools have accounted for half a percent of school closures. We educate 12% of the nation. We represent 0.5% of school closures. Yes, we might be erring on the side of caution, but the numbers are bearing out that what we're doing is keeping kids in classrooms, which is our focus, keeping kids in classrooms. So that's my direction. That's where I am. I encourage us to keep working on our quarantines. I'm glad that we're doing what we can for that middle school cohort. Um, and I wanna keep doing everything we can to get kids on campus, educated in their classrooms as safely and as, and as quickly as possible. That's where I'm at. So who wants to jump in next? Jennifer? Jennifer. Thank you, John. I, I, um, I appreciate your clarity and your, um, and, I, and I agree with much of what you said, most of what you said, well, actually all of what you said in the sense that I still go round and round in my head in a couple of things. What, um, how do we act and then the state acts and what becomes of our actions when the state actions come through? That's uh, so I don't know if that's a clarifying question or a um, and, and how we adjust to that. Um, I agree. I, the, the personal exemption is a why bother to me. I feel like the state acted um, years ago to remove personal exemptions from vaccinations because of the outbreaks that we saw with the measles and whooping cough and and it was um, detrimental to our kids. And I think that those, um, those actions prove beneficial for our kids. Um, I still feel like I think it, um, that it's a much better policy when it comes from a state. Um, I, I think that we're going in that direction and kind of in line with that as a district. So um, I guess I don't know what the, what the um, but I would definitely, um, get ready for that because I agree with you. I think it is what looks like the direction of our state moving towards so that we should be on board with that and we should, we should understand that and we should move in that direction. Um, I think um, I heard a couple of things today. I heard that a school in LA County closed today because of COVID cases. I was kind of shocking. It was a little shocking to me. Um, it was a charter school. Oh, um, and, um, but I also heard a couple of other things. I heard that surgical masks are 70% effective for those who wear them and other, and for, in terms of um, giving and receiving, uh, or not giving and not receiving um, germs and, and particles. And, and so um, I am, I think that we should absolutely understand. And, and that's just surgical masks. There are the N94s and N95s and all of that. So, those are even higher. And I also heard that 90% of COVID cases are transmitted indoors and our kids are indoors. Um, although it's interesting that the facts uh, bear out where sports are a big player in, in the transmission of, of the COVID. So I think that we have to figure, I think we have to, because there are no masks. I think we, um, if there's any way to 
look at that and mitigate that. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, maybe a little more precaution for those kids. Um, um, those are my thoughts at the moment. I'll... I got Richard next. I've, I've got Richard next and Lori. John, can you hear me okay if I speak at this level? John. I'm sorry, Richard. Can I say one more thing? Of course. Um, I, I, I have children in the district. Thank you, Jen, for saying that. I appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're fine, Richard. You're fine. Okay, I'm in a hotel in New York, and so the Wi-Fi is terrible, so I've been bouncing in and out. Um, so I, I want to say that um, I, too, appreciate everybody who spoke tonight, uh, whether we agree or disagree. I want to say that I've never called anybody a terrorist or maligned anybody for coming and speaking a point of difference of opinion with regards to myself. And so I don't know what else to say than other than that um, I have great respect for the speakers and I've listened intently to everyone who spoke. Um, I'll get the easy step first pertaining to Dr. Drati's report, which was great with all of the different contributions there. Um, I'm very eager as are some of the speakers we heard tonight and, um, and the people we're getting emails from for us to be having a plan, which I know you do, Dr. Drati. I know your team is working on it. I was at the DAC meeting this week for health and safety and heard the report from your staff about the, the plans and the, and the preparations unfolding for, um, for better times. I do think we need off ramps Right. So when it comes to thinking about the mask, I think many of us celebrated the news that we got today about our performing our vocal arts kids being able to, to perform and not perform, but be able to, you know, kind of get back in the classroom and do some things. So it's evidence that we're thinking of the kids, thinking of their um, joy of learning and getting them back in those areas. So I just want to say, John, and to my peers that I think we need to continue to support our superintendent and his staff at monitoring this as closely as he can, they can with all the experts and finding off ramps. I think we're calling them off ramps or ways in which when the numbers continue to improve. And, and I think that um, one of the reasons California has as the lowest cases of any state in the country right now is because of the types of actions that we have taken collectively as a, as a community up and down the state. When it comes to the uh, mandate stuff, I remember, Jen, what you had said at our last discussion where you echoed or you said first uh, what you just echoed tonight about your belief that the state should act. And I think there were several others of us on the board who said the same thing. And we, we read um, Assemblymember Bloom and Senator Allen's letter and we heard what other districts were doing. And so we were, as a board in our discussion items, talking about advocating to the state to do exactly what it seems like the governor is about to do um, and noting what Lori said about what, is, what did he exactly do, et cetera. I think that that's an important question for us. So um, long story short, I support um, essentially what John said about um, following what the governor has outlined. Um, I wouldn't go any more quickly than what the governor has said. Um, so I think that we should follow that. And that would be my personal choice uh, as a member of this board in direction towards the superintendent. I too agree with John and Jen that the personal exemption, um, I don't support that. Um, that I think that it is um, all appropriate to have a mandate that's my my personal understandings and belief and what I think is right for the students in our district. Um, but I thrilled um, that the governor took the step that he did. In fact, it did a bit of a dance when um, I heard the news because I thought how great it is that that is a centralized decision for our state being made and by our representatives, hopefully at the state legislature. So those, that's just my two cents right now. Um, thank Richard, you. if I could clarify something you said um, so that the direction is, is right for Dr. Drotti. Um, is your implication that 
you would want to wait for the emergency youth authorization to be lifted for 12 and up before doing anything. Is that correct? And then start the timeline after that event. Yes, but I, yes, but I agree with what you said that, um, yes, John, because that's what the governor said, right? But I think what you said and what I agreed with, and I wanna make sure I echo or say ditto to what you um, articulated is that, say that emergency authorization is uh, removed um, and the governor says, oh, it has to take place the next term or whatever the language was in his comments. Um, but you said maybe 60 days that maybe we are, that we expedite it there. But I think that we could look at, our board should look at and give direction to Dr. Dreddy to the kind of the overall themes, if you will, um, minus the um, individual mandate. Does that make any sense, John? Yeah, it does. I think, I think Dr. Dreddy had a clarifying question for you. Just for my clarification, I think I'm following along. I think the only thing that's ambiguous to me is about the timeline, right? The timeline. So uh, when I presented, I said there, there's a legislative fix and there's an executive order fix. And then there is the piece that um, uh, uh, Mr. Lieberman just mentioned uh, of how this could occur. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the timeline is the issue. Uh, so if and in February that the, uh, the emergency authorization is lifted and there's an executive order or legislative action or the third option happening in February, 60 days after that, is that what we're saying that you would want us to ask uh, staff to be, uh, students to be vaccinated? Right? Can I give my two cents to that? My two cents would be that we should have that conversation when it happens, that our board would be saying to use John's word, we're going, words, we're going to cue to what the governor has said with the kind of overall direction that he articulated. And that if that emergency authorization is pulled on February 1st, and, and our board wants to reconvene and have a conversation, if we want to move 60 days and not wait for the next term type thing, that could happen then. I don't think we should give direction on something like that at this moment. Um, that's just my, my thinking. Okay, so uh, let, let's. We'll, I'll mirror everything back when we're when we finish. But uh, Lori, then Maria. Um, I'm not sure where to start, but um, I I will start by saying that I I know it's not likely to change the tenor of the conversation that continues to occur, board meeting after board meeting, but. There are clearly different points of view on the issue of vaccinations. And there are, and within those who are opposed, there are different points of view. So there are, I, I, the differences are not lost on me and I don't think they're lost on my colleagues either. Um, but I do think that sometimes we have, all have to come to terms with the fact that some things, some differences of opinion can't be harmonized. And that and it, it doesn't mean that no one's listening and that no one's being heard and that there's no empathy with some of what's being expressed if in fact one or more of us um, doesn't have the same point of view or if we take an action that isn't consistent with that. I don't know where we're going to end up here, but I guess I just wanted to say that because I just think it's critical to the future of our school community, of our city, of the nation, of everyone, that we uh, take heed of what Erica Leslie said about the level of anger out there and start trying to focus on the content of what we're all talking about and hear each other, but recognize that, that because we are able to hear each other, there will be times when we don't agree and when decisions get made that we don't all love and or agree with but that doesn't mean that nobody's listening and that nobody cares. Um, all that said, after our last board meeting, I did exactly what I thought we wanted, we had expressed we wanted to do. I wrote to CSBA, I wrote to CTA, I wrote to Tony Thurman's office, <laughs> I wrote to everyone I could think of at every level of government. Um, and. Then the, lo and behold, the governor did what he did sometime after that. And then after that, 
for some reason that actually it's because my email apparently went to spam. I didn't hear from Tony Thurman's office until yesterday. And so I, I just kind of wanted to add into the mix um, some of what I, I had a conversation today with um, one of uh, the superintendent of public instructions deputies. And she said, and I quote, that the superintendent of public instruction encourages and applauds districts passing their own mandates. I had a long conversation with her about the governor um, and what he did and didn't do. And actually that conversation was before I learned of the thing I shared with you 20 minutes ago. So that's even stranger, but, but in any case, I just wanted to share the point of view of yet another um, elected leader um, in the state. And I also wanna say that that position is in harmony with what I do think was an incredibly um, confused message that was put out by the governor. But part of what the governor said, in addition to what seems to be direction he gave to the Department of Public Health is that um, he verbal, he said it in his announcement that uh, I don't I don't know what his exact words were, but that school local school districts were um, I, I don't know if he used the word encouraged, but um, I thought he said encouraged to do what they felt was appropriate in the meantime. So I just want to add that out there. And then the one other thing I will say is, as Richard mentioned, Ben Allen and Richard Bloom sent us a letter before I've confirmed that their position is still the same, that they support us taking an action. I don't understand what the several people were who were saying strange things about Ben Allen and what we owed or what, I don't I have no idea what that was about, but and it would be great if we didn't malign people who are serving us in other places um, when they don't have points of view that happen to align with ours. In any case, I generally, my biggest concern with waiting for the governor's um, direction to take effect is that I don't know when it will take effect. And the confusion that was created immediately was that every newspaper article had it differently. Some of them said emergency authorization, the next term, which is likely to be January, those 12 students 12 and up will be um, mandated to be vaccinated, assuming that the FDA has permanently uh, uh, approved the vaccine. Others said, oh, it's gonna take place in um, fall of 2022. And, and in fact, more of the reports said that, but all everyone was interpreting, I think, what they heard because it was a press release or a press announcement. So I still don't think we know. And, and I think that's, I mean, it, my concern is that to use a, to give a really specific example, if the FDA were to provide permanent authorization for a vaccine for students 12 and up or children 12 and up in November, let's say, um, or November or December, I'm not, it's not at all clear to me that the state will have done, will have taken any action to implement what was an announcement. So then I think that all those newspaper articles will have had it right, which is that there won't be a mandate until fall of 2022, even though we would be sitting in a position where there was a permanent authorization given. So that's my biggest concern. And that's why I feel that I believe that actually the majority of our community would, would like us to comply with what the spirit of what the governor said and what I think people initially took from it was, which is once, there's, once there is um, permanent approval of, uh, by, this, by the FDA, that following that, um, that group there that he called it grade, grade spans, but it's actually age and everybody, as we know, ages don't always quite match up, but 12 and over um, 
I'm kind of losing my, my train of thought, but I think the spirit initially I agree with, or what I thought was the spirit, which is that once there is permanent authorization, a reasonable period, whether I mean, we can quibble over whether it's 45 to 60 days or what that right, right period is. I'm not, I'm much less concerned with what that time period is, but what, what the trigger is. I hate using that word. And I've been trying to excise words like that from my vocabulary, but the, I, I think the emergence, the approval of the permanent authorization should be the active, the thing that activates the uh, whatever the time period is before we implement the mandate. And the reason I think I would rather do it now than later is simply that it gives everyone time to get ready administratively and otherwise, because then everybody knows that when it happens, whether it's in a month or it's in three months or it's in six months, we will have, people will be emotionally prepared and, and our district can be administratively prepared. So that, that's kind of my thinking. I, I, I also agree with John and Jen and Richard about the personal exemption. And that's the other key, which is if we're gonna sit here and wait for what the governor announced to take effect, we will also be living with a personal exemption. Now, I don't know, I mean, the other total, look, I have no idea what happens if we do something, then the governor does something else and then the legislature gets to speak and they might do something different. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's a whole kettle of fish. I, I guess I, I don't, I can't speak to right now. I don't even know how to. And I think we're just going around saying where we're, where we're leaning. So I guess, I think I, I think I've spoken my piece. Just for clarity purposes, uh, for, for, for our purpose, staff preparation, mm -hmm. I, I'm always looking at the authority you would have to do any of this. So um, we, we discuss what the state would need to do to give us the authority if it comes up from the state. We talked about three options, the one we described at the end, and also the personal uh, the, um, executive order or the legislative action. So that's that's the state. Let's just say the, the state doesn't do anything and the FDA provides um, full authorization. Mm -hmm. um, all the lawyers in the past have said that once that's done, then the districts can implement their own mandate outside of the, the state, but we would need a resolution, some kind of resolution or, or, or policy at that point. So, so either way, if we do it, we need four things to take place. If it's state, we need we, we cover three, right? And then if it's the board, then we, we need some kind of resolution or something like that. Well, I can share one thing on this. I'm, I, I'm kind of confused by that last thing on the resolution. The ways this can happen, the, the most effective way for it to happen would be for the state assembly to take action and either create a special type of vaccine mandate or add this to the 10 that already exist. Yes. So that would be the legislature doing that. That's one way. The governor could do an executive order, but that is not as effective as the state assembly. Second, a health agency can impose the mandate. LA Department of Health, California Department of Health can impose a mandate. Okay. The legislature could give authority or allow other state agencies to oppose mandates. We are a state agency. Now, the legislature has not authorized us yet, but the governor did put this out there. So now we're getting closer to that category. And now, lastly, because this is important to people say that we have no authority to do this. While there is no clear authority for a school district to impose a, MAC, a vaccine mandate, there is no explicit code disallowing a school district from passing a mandate. So I just want to make it clear. I am not a lawyer. I have spoken to lawyers throughout the state, other areas that are using mandates. This area is very gray because in people's lifetimes, they haven't dealt with this very often, but it is a gray area. And those are the ways this could happen. And can I just add on that piece? Other districts have made the decision to pass resolutions, LAUSD, Culver City, actually Culver City wasn't by resolution. I think it was the superintendent um, emergency order. Oakland, Sacramento last week, San Diego. San Diego, they have 
decided, and clearly they have legal advice, that there is presumably, so whether it's ed code, constitutional provisions, that, that there are um, ways under which local districts can act. And I do think that the governor and the superintendent of public instruction and our state senator and state assembly person have all encouraged that too. So um, I agree with John, it's not, a, it's not clear. Um, it's not as clear as the other ways, but I don't think that it's not possible. And one thing I would say is if we do adopt a resolution, um, but actually whether we do adopt a vaccine mandate by resolution or not, I would ask that we adopt a resolution urging the state, whether it's the governor or the legislature, I guess it would have to be the legislature, honestly, that they um, get rid of whatever the proper word is, eliminate the personal exemption when they, when and if they take action um, regarding the addition of the mandate for the reasons that people have described. It's just that there's no mandate. If there's, I mean, that, that just means there's no mandate. I don't understand that. I understand a religious exemption. I understand a medical exemption for sure, but I don't understand a personal exemption. Uh, let me get to Maria. Maria. Well, you know, we can go on and on tonight. Thank you, you know, for everybody. You know, these comments were very interesting is all I could say. Um, I think for many of us on the board, I think we, we take our work seriously, that we're here representing um, all of our students in this district, both in the cities of, of Malibu and Santa Monica, that we're here to protect students. We're here to protect our teachers, our staff, and everybody that's in our district. So, um, you know, John, you alluded to the fact that people, you know, spoke tonight out of fear, whatever. And I'm speaking out of fear on the other side of it. I'm speaking on the fear that for me, the, the, the idea of, an, of, a, of a vaccine, you know, and all of our families took advantage right away because of that fear that we, we, we did not want to get COVID, that we wanted to be alive. And especially because I have a mother who's in hospice at home. So for me, it's that fear of making sure there's safety mechanism that goes beyond just not my home and my immediate family, but just the fear of making sure that none of my students or none of my teachers or, or staff get, get COVID, get sick. And I don't care if it's even a slight, you know, flu, you know, symptoms of any sort. To me, you know, that's that people have to really take into consideration statements that they made tonight. They really do. I mean, that's my own personal thing, but I guess everybody could just, we can agree to disagree because we can have all the extras you know, that we want on our side of it for pro, and we can have all the, you know, um, experts on the other against vaccine vaccinations, and we can have it all. I mean, there's a gamut all out there, um, but at the end of the day, we have to do what's best for the benefit of everybody in the school district. That's what we got elected to do. Um, so the conversation we started on September 22nd, of course, was premature, I think, because things have changed. Tonight, again, we're having another conversation that can again be premature because between, you know, today, October 17th and maybe November the, and November the 20th, things can change in 30 days or less. So for me, I mean, I'm glad that, you know, I I'm glad that we're having this conversation in terms of finding safety mechanisms and for me, the vaccine is a, is a one of a multi-layer of um, things that you have to move forward to at least prevent COVID. So the vaccine itself isn't going to prevent it. But the fact that we've been testing and masking, I think, curbs it. And that's what, at least in this district, we've been doing. That thank you to all the families, to all the students, and everybody that have gotten vaccinated, that have gone with the testing, and whatever it took. It's contained our numbers. I have to say that it's contained in both cities, whether you know people have differences or whatever. You know, for me, it's a safety mechanism and a safety factor. And after you know, Nurse, you know, Bressler and Barrett showed us that example of of, of eight students that, that 
tested positive in the 450 students that it involved and narrowing down to just instead of isolating or, or the, the you know 450 students, it was only 70 students at the end of the day. So there's just so much involved, so much unknown. And, and for me, all I can say, I wanna move forward with, with coming to a point where we are probably gonna to move towards you know um, mandated vaccine. But again, I don't really wanna do it until we can get an FDA, you know, FDA approval on this. And whether we hear it from, from the governor or not, I think things will change in the government, you know, like the governor's press release was just a press release. But I think a lot of these things will change. Give it some time for, for I think, for whatever the powers to be in Sacramento to have this discussion and the pressure that I think all of us, not just only as school board members, but as parents and communities put, I think on our legislators, that we're going to get responses sooner than later. So I really don't want to get into a situation where we're going to take to, to decide whether we're going to mandate it 60 days after this. The timelines for me is irrelevant right now because things can change, like I said. So at this point, uh, all I want to make sure is that I'm in, I'm for the direction at one point, I'm hoping that the state um, does mandate the, you know, the, the vaccine because I'm in the, I'm in that other fear factor. That's the only thing that's going to protect it. And I do, I don't have children in the district now, but I have a grandson and I have a future granddaughter that will be in this district. So I have, you know, skin in the game here because I've got my kiddos that are coming in and my first grader grandson, I mean, he's gone through the testing <laughs> and it's, it's their common way of life now after all this to wear masks, to get tested and just to walk in this world with, how can I say it? You don't wanna create fear in them because I, I, I try really hard and all of us in the family try really hard not to, not to create that fear factor that we can easily do to our kids. But just to understand, have them understand that this is not, at least for right now, the way of life post COVID, you know, because this is where we are. And I'm hoping the day will come, well, they'll get to see what we got to see without and enjoying life without masks. But I think we've gotten to the point where we're not beholden to certain things that we take, like actions that we take and are gonna stay forever. Um, we'll be lifting, I think, as soon as we get um, and we're getting uh, and we get guidance through the county, through the state, whoever. It's not our choice, you know. Again, we're not acting as the doctors or the researchers or whatever. We follow, I think, the guidelines from the county, from the state, from the whatever. And so, following them, if they start lifting at the fact that we don't need, you know, at one point they were saying you don't need to, to, to wear masks. Then all of us said, no, now you do have to, make, you know. So. You know, I think we'll work with, with, with the mandates as they begin to change and lift, because we'll do that immediately. You know, we're doing that now, like today we heard from, thank you, Dr. Drati, that our choral are gonna be, you know, and our music program is gonna go, be able to go indoors now. So, I mean, so as things come around, we'll move forward. But at this point, you know, I, I don't really want to say that I'm, I want to, uh, to set up, um, a, a resolution for tonight to move forward because I, I don't I don't think I would vote for one now but at least a direction is I think Dr. Drati is already moving forward to um, making some plans in 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 and when it does come to us that we need to make that and we can make a decision quickly we've had emergent I mean we've had we've been meeting on a weekly basis almost so so the fact that we can move and the board then this board can actually do an emergency meeting if we have to to mandate something, we will do that. But um, at least at least at this point, we need to hear more because so there's a lot of uncertainty down out there. And this give it some time between now and 30 to maybe by December, the things I know will change in the next 30 to 60 days if changes are going to take place in January. So at this point, um, all I can recommend, Dr. Drati, is that is that we move forward with what we're doing and encouraging. I think families to, to be as positive and to really be protective of, this, of their community. If they are protective and you know what you need to do then to protect your community, that's up to you. If you wanna protect your community or not, that's up to you. But I think I will, I will, as a person on this board, will commit myself to protect the health and safety of my school community. Thank you.
Um, Keith or Craig, you guys want to jump in here? Yeah, Craig. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so I, I'm with Maria. I, I think the right thing for this board to do is to give it time. Uh, I don't, um, as you know from last time, I have huge um, philosophical issues overall, but I think we have a very practical issue, uh, several practical issues um, that are very much best served by letting the people who have the proper authority lead. Um, as we've discussed tonight, the legislature could lead, the governor of the CDE could lead, the county health folks could lead. They all have the resources and the clear authority. And if they're not moving, we got to ask ourselves, why not? You know, my mom used to say to me, if Mikey jumped off the bridge, would you? And I, I feel like this is a situation where if Mikey didn't jump off the bridge, why would you? Why would we step in front of these folks? And, and you know, I have an expected value model in my head that says moving forward with this vaccine mandate is not a good expected value that if you do the probabilities and what we're gonna to try to prevent versus what we might have, it all works out. So we're really not supposed to impose this, but that's my model and what the heck do I know, right? I'm not a doctor, I'm not immersed in this. Um, there are people at LA County Health who do this 26 hours a day and have been doing it since March of last year. There are people at the state level who know this stuff and they're not moving. So for us to move and, and, and in doing so, going back to another thing Maria said, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of fear out there and fear from every side. Um, fear of learning loss, fear of not being in school, fear of being in school, fear of being vaccinated, fear of not being vaccinated. And, you know, the, the greatest unspoken health crisis or, or second to COVID in how we think about it is the mental health crisis that's just roaring through our communities because of, however, 18, 20 months of constant fear and upset from COVID, from a global pandemic. So to the extent that we can move calmly and slowly and with love and compassion for everybody, I think we would be doing a great, great, great service to our community and to me acting in the role that we're meant to be acting in, which is as wise, caring uh, school board that's looking out over the overall health of our community and doing our best to take as much strain out and to, to protect our community as best we can, which is not necessarily the same thing as taking an extreme action to make sure that this one thing is carefully protected. Because when you do that, you cause other problems and then you have to weigh the problems. So, um, you know, for me, it's very clear that we absolutely should not move ahead of the folks who have the direct responsibility and the resources to make the decision. Um, there's no question in my mind that that's the right thing to do. Um, and I would also say I would not, I would be voting no on a resolution brought forward today. Um, the other thing that I think this board needs to consider is when John mentioned all the schools, quote unquote, in our community that have imposed vaccine mandates, to the best of my knowledge, Oaks Christian Viewpoint and Las Virginis Unified School District, all of it have not imposed vaccine mandates, quite the contrary. And those are the folks that compete against Malibu schools. And those are the places where Malibu kids go if we impose a vaccine mandate and you've heard from speakers, and I have no reason to doubt that the numbers are approximately correct. Um, the vast majority of people in Malibu are, I'll say two thirds of people in Malibu, roughly speaking, are vaccinated and two thirds of them do not want the school district telling them that they have to do a vaccination for their child, though most likely they themselves would make that choice. 
So we also have a problem which what makes perfect sense perhaps in Santa Monica does not make the same sense in Malibu where we're having huge problems with this enrollment. And I think we need to be very, very careful when we say what's happening around our community to remember that what's happening around the Malibu community is very different and those competitive pressures are very different. Um, so um, going back to the main message, I think we need to give it time. I, I, I would strongly suggest, and I think it's right. I think by not taking action, we put more pressure on the folk, pardon me, on the folks who should be taking action to take that action. So I have very little doubt that they will take that action and we should let them. And if they don't, then there's, that's a message for us too. Thank you. Sure, uh, Keith, I'm sure you wanna jump in. And Craig, just for clarity, um, I don't believe I said all the private schools. If I did, I misspoke. I can check the record. I thought I said many or some. If I did say all, I, I, I misspoke. If I, I didn't, because I understand what you're saying. I, I understand the yeah. point that you're making. It, it, so it, I, just wanna, I just wanna say that if I did say all, that was misspeaking, or if you, if I didn't, you put words in my mouth. So I just okay. want to be clear. I, 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 and my point was not um, all or nothing. My point is that the two environments are um, are differently surrounded. I did call Oaks Christian? They didn't get back to me. Neither did okay. St. Monica. So I think religious schools are a different situation. Yeah, and OLM. I also, did try. I did try. Yeah, OLM, from what I can tell of their websites, and obviously Las Virginis made a very clear public statement, um, I think prior to or immediately after our last board meeting on this subject, um, along the lines that I just said. So um, I think it, 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 I wasn't trying to play gotcha with the language of all or some or whatever. I'm just saying, I think I fully expect that the environment and the the desires and in Santa Monica and Malibu are importantly different. And that's the point that I am, uh, I am making. Keith. Um, well, I, I think that one thing that's, um, that's, that's clear with uh, the, these moves that have been made by leadership, uh, by the governor, uh, some of the comments um, that Lori described relative to Superintendent of Public Construction, uh, Tony Thurman, um, is uh, really thematic in nature. I mean, this is a thematic structure. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that in some respects, the tea leaves are being, being read or the tea leaves are being deployed you know, by said leadership. You know, the fact that uh, the governor may have put forward a press release instead of a mandate at this time is a moot point in some respects. Um, because the very fact that, uh, that the press release was made in the manner in which it did, it, it basically serves to describe the future uh, and where things are moving and where things are going. Secondly, I think that, that Lori had described uh, an email that she had just received today that spoke to something other than the press release itself. And then I actually did some review. Uh, and indeed, uh, Governor Newsom has directed the California Department of Public Health to begin to view and review how the COVID-19 vaccine will be added to that list of immunizations that are on the record uh, as, uh, as, as deemed um, necessary for, uh, for in-person you know, student matriculation. So, so that's a thematic structure. Um, and similarly, in terms of the superintendent, I think the comment was the superintendent applauds districts in, uh, in doing their own work or doing their own mandates. You know, we have to, to really look and see what, what, what those things really are in, uh, in the field of um, governance. You know, those are nudges, right? Those are inferences. That's nuance and that's context that these particular institutions uh, are beginning to sort of 
you know, move the train down the track uh, in that way. And so uh, someone else um, described taking some form of action in the sense of, of the district or others getting ready that some of these comments and these descriptions start a process such that it's going to take, going to have, uh, take time for folks to get ready. Uh, I forget who said this um, mentally and possibly organizationally. And so these things um, are moving forward in a way that they're starting to, to simmer, right? They're starting to be curated uh, slowly um, so that when the time comes that they can be implemented and they can be uh, moved forward in a, in a collective way and an efficient way. And so uh, I think that that's what's happening, right? Um, and and, and it's, it's, uh, it's governance um, that's being modest and being calm uh, and humble and curious in, in, its, uh, in its movement forward. Uh, the other thing that was interesting to me, uh, I think John described uh, these, these data points um, in terms of the students at Samuel High, and that number was somewhere around, I believe it was like 85% or something of the students at Samuel High uh, were vaccinated. Um, those are students making those decisions. Uh, to do so, perhaps in concert with their, with their parents. Um, and I believe the number at Malibu High was 66%. Uh, those were students making those decisions in concert with their parents. And, and those numbers are, are what they are um, in the sense that, 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 that those individuals uh, made that choice, made that decision to move forward. And those numbers are, are, are very high uh, in that way. One of the other things that would be interesting, and, and I don't know if we've really done this uh, very much, uh, and that is to, to kind of welcome uh, student voices in a different kind of way. You know, um, where, where are the students really on these things? And I, and I think that some of my colleagues did speak to some of the conversations, uh, perhaps with some students, uh, their interest, uh, their uh, focus on their own personal safety, safety of their friends uh, and their other uh, student colleagues, uh, they have a different kind of a mindset when it comes to these kinds of things. And maybe even some of the younger students, uh, you know, some months ago uh, when parents may have been very concerned uh, about them with masks and et cetera, but the students were okay with masks and they just wanted to be with their friends. And so I think that moving forward, we want to do a better job of actually listening uh, and, and practicing maybe some more Socratic inquiry with these young folks and with these students to get their perspective uh, on, on much of what uh, we're, uh, we're talking about and much of, the, of what we're moving forward uh, in, in terms of decision making uh, in, their, in their best interest. Um, you know, and, and in light of that, uh, and it's something that, that we've spoken about you know, a bit previously, uh, to continue for us to, to, to civilly uh, agree to disagree, uh, to try and be respectful, uh, because uh, some of the, the toxicity and negativity and that, that clearly has happened, unfortunately, in, 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 in our particular uh, Santa Monica Malibu uh, family um, and around the Cal California and around the country, uh, the kids are watching uh, adults. The kids are listening to what we as adults say and words matter, behavior matters. And these kids are gonna be modeling that same behavior, uh, which, which is frightening in some respects uh, based on how many adults have been acting you know, over time. And so, uh, I don't really know that if parents want their kids to be acting the way that they are uh, and have been acting, you know, uh, what our parents have been acting the way that we are acting now, you know, so I think that uh, as we continue to move forward, focusing in on learning and focusing in on young folks flourishing and keeping them safe, let's continue to look within ourselves 
so that we can understand that we are being our best selves uh, for the benefit of our, our, our young people moving forward. This is a collective action. And uh, to, again, to echo the sentence, sentiments of my colleagues, I think that um, letting, letting time pass, uh, I think there would be some actions moving forward fairly quickly uh, in terms of these mandates from, from other forms of leadership, but that probably is the best course of action. Um, I also don't agree uh, and would not support personal exemption as, as others have described, but that uh, the, the, the state, uh, whether it's the governor's office, Department of Education, Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, they will continue to move forward in a certain direction. And I think that we want to uh, be mindful of that uh, as we move forward. Okay. Um, I'm going to attempt to, uh, to review the direction uh, from the board members. And as expected, there is a, a wide variety of opinions. So I'm going to try to distill it the best I can, Ben, for what you got going forward. Um, while, while I, there does seem to be a small majority who are interested in getting more details on what would happen if we looked at the lifting of the emergency youth authorization as a activation point where we would then go 60 days out for 12 and up. Um, I think it's also important to figure out if, is there a time where it's not feasible for staff to accomplish that? If it were to, if it were to not happen until February 1 or February 15, is it too disruptive to put something in at that late date? Um, but I think we need to be, I think there is a majority, there's a majority of board members who are, who want to be ready when the EUA gets lifted to then activate something. Um, I think some of the other stuff is out of our hands. I, I, I want to stress that nobody here spoke about five to 11 year olds. That was not a topic of conversation. Yes, no one is talking about th that, that, that EUA will probably be for fall of 2022. And by then we should have seen more action in Sacramento. So for people who are concerned about younger age children, that's not a topic of discussion in this room. If you wish to independently avail yourself of vaccinations, that is a personal choice between you and your doctor and your decision calculus. Um, so Ben, I, I do think there is enough interest to seeing what is plausible for us to put together once the emergency youth authorization gets lifted with a legitimate time for people to react. Um, but I think there's also interest in, I mean, look, there's, since the beginning of COVID, we've always looked to Sacramento and said, boy, wouldn't it be great if they led the way on this so we didn't have to. And every step of the way we've been disappointed. So people ask, why are school boards making all these decisions? We're making these decisions because of a vacuum of leadership in Sacramento. That's why we're doing it. We're, we're still reading new things from the governor. That will inform us over the next couple of weeks. I, so I guess the recommendation then is to see what we can put together to work for the district and bring a resolution back on the fourth based on that direction. And then in two weeks, we'll have two more weeks of experience and research. But I think there's enough, I think there's enough, there are enough board members who are behind a 60 day period after the EUA is lifted. Or I, I mean, I don't know if EUA is lifted. You mean after Full permanent authorization, authorization is given by the FDA? Correct, which is the lifting of the EUA. So we can say it's the same thing. Okay. Well, that's it. Yeah, okay. Potato, no, that's potato. <laughs> potato, potato. Um, that, that's the direction that I hear. And I, and I say this knowing full well that th there's not a clear, there's not a unified voice on this board about this topic. I, I, and it's not surprising that there isn't. And I think when it does come back to us uh, in a couple of weeks, we have to respect the, all the voices and, and speak, speak for the, the, the full community. So anyway, I, I know you took notes. Let me just reflect back. So in two weeks, and by the way, in between now and two weeks from now, uh, we're going to take a crack at some resolutions with what I heard, what I heard right now. 
and I'll be I'll be running it by you all individually, so that so that we don't break the uh, break the Brown Act to make sure it is it captures people's sentiments, and then we'll bring it back and forth for uh, more debate. Uh, I think I think what we're hoping for in the fourth is the fourth the fourth is a resolution where it's we, we can't keep having discussions on this. I mean, people are right. The reason why we didn't talk about COVID on the, on October seventh yeah. was because we had to talk about the educational uh, 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 assessments and things we were doing to monitor. Like that's what we're here for. The school board is here to govern the operations of the district. We're not here to to, to meddle in into everything that Dr. Moore is doing, even though it feels that way sometimes. You know, we need to, we need to get back to making sure our budget is sound, making sure our staff is taken care of, making sure that the operations run smoothly. That's what we're doing. COVID operations are a big part of that right now, but we can't keep talking about this. I think we need to be prepared on November 4th, thumbs up, thumbs down on a resolution that reflects the direction you heard. And you've heard competing things today. So I, 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 I can't tell you, yes. I, the only way I'll be able to decipher and bring something uh, based on my, my meetings with everyone and the individual is to try to have meetings. So that's, that's the only way we get that done. So. Absolutely. Hey, John. I'm gonna say I don't Go ahead. I have some concerns about that. Okay, first things first, I wanna say that uh, if this helps any, I think we have a meeting on November 18th too. And is that, so I'm, I was just thinking if it gave you a little more time, I don't, I think nothing is gonna happen. What is gonna happen likely before that is that the FDA is gonna give temporary authorization to a vaccine for children ages five to 11. So, and then the Department of Public Health locally in the state are gonna encourage parents to get their children vaccinated. Yeah. That's a fact, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah. But that's separate and apart from this, but that's gonna happen. What I, the reason I said that is I do think, if I, if I look this up properly, the temporary authorization was given for ages 12 and up in early May. I don't know the exact date, early to mid-May. And the, uh, all of the articles seem to say that the FDA usually waits um, around six, about six months because they want to look at the data and that all makes sense. Now, uh, we don't know obviously whether they're going to wait six months or they're going to wait 12 months. But if they waited six months, that means it's early November. So I guess what, what I'm saying is nothing is going to happen if we were, if we're looking at something, if, whether it's us or the state or whoever, um, if we're looking at something that happens 60 days from some date in November, um, we can wait till the 18th. The other thing is if something, if, if news does start to percolate and there is something that's on the FDA docket in November, which I don't know whether that will happen. It may be that the CDE or, uh, or the department, I'm sorry, the, the California Department of Public Health acts in order to enact what the governor said. So in a way that gives a little time for that piece to develop, okay. because I, I do think those of us who spoke in favor of them, um, if I can sort of speak for the people who I think, think that the district should do something, if the state did something and in a timely manner, I, we'd all be happy with that. I, I mean, I think we would prefer that if I can speak for at least John and Jen who are sitting next to me uh, and nodding. And I think that, I don't even know if Richard's on this call anymore, um, but based on what he said, I, I, th I think that anybody would prefer that. It, that goes to John's comments earlier about how we all wanted the state to act, you know, ever since COVID occurred and we've been, had a hard time with that. So. Anyway, all I'm saying is we might move from November okay, 4th so, so that, to the 18th, and that suggestion. might help we, a little bit. If we, if we use November 4th to get back to another meeting where we're not hyper-focused on COVID, we talk about some of the other school issues that are coming up and addressing on the 18th. That's a good suggestion. Craig, you wanted to jump in? I did, yeah. And I'd like to, to add to what Lori said. So I think every one of these meetings is harmful to the body politic. And I think we all think that the 
the the the politicians the 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 environment in which we operate is going to keep moving around. And as Lori said, the FD, FDA is going to do stuff and that could trigger other stuff. And da, 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 da. So my suggestion, piggybacking on what other people said tonight, is what I heard is there is an appetite, um, probably for a majority of the board, that at very least that the district be ready to move independently at such a time as the, I'm going to say this wrong, but the permanent authorization of um, 12, to, 12 to 16 is, is made available. And there's an open question as to how much lead time the district would need to have in order to follow up on that. And then there's the open timeline of how long should we wait after that. So my suggestion is that's not something the board should, I think, mostly to be debating. That's kind of a factual thing that Ben should work with staff and the nurses and whatever and say, when this mandate comes down, if the board does want to move forward with it, um, independent of any state action, these are the timelines. And if and when the FDA does come down and propose that, he'll have that in his pocket. We can bring that back and we'll see where the board is. And in the meantime, if the, if the governor moves or the legislature moves, um, then we haven't wasted time and upset a bunch of people on something that we're not going to do because the state's already done something different. So my proposal is Ben gets ready to do what I hear the majority of the board probably wants to do. He keeps that in his pocket until it's actually actionable. And in the meantime, if the state moves, then we, we have that option as well. And I say that against the backdrop that I understand I'm in the minority here. I'm just trying to keep the mental health quotient as high as I can, knowing that the, the, the will of the board is probably not where I am. Craig, let me, let me see if I, if I get this right from you, because if I hear you correctly, I agree with you. <laughs> it's, tough, it's tough through, through the speakers. Are, are you implying that, that Ben gets ready so that the board does not have to continued discussion of this item, Ben gets ready with a resolution that he will pull out once, when and if the full authorization for 12 to 15 is activated. So once that event comes, Ben comes to the board with the resolution and we take action at that point, as opposed to taking action preemptively. Is that what you're saying or am I mishearing you? Yes, that is what I'm saying with the caveat that I'm not in favor of that action, but that to me is what is most merciful on the body politic rather than just keep talking about something we can't do anyway, making everybody crazy. So yes, I think that would be the best thing to do. Okay. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion, Craig. Thank you for that. And I know it, it does speak in, in contrary to what your personal beliefs on this are. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, Maybe it is best then for Ben, you to do what you say you were going to do, which is to talk to individual board members. Maybe they'll feel more comfortable talking to you one on one. And I, I think we will know more by November 18th. That's a possibility. If we don't know more by November 18th, maybe we are just we can wait until we have that, that clarity that we need that Craig is speaking to, which is the lifting of the EUA. I think that's a good suggestion. So, well, you, okay. Well, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm, if I can make a quick, quick comment on that, and we've been talking about this, and that, that's what we were describing about thematic structure and the tea leaves. You know, there's signaling going on, and, and that's, you know, signaling now is coming, obviously, from the, the federal government. And, uh, you know, the Biden administration has been very clear on, um, you know, anticipating the approval, you know, as, as John described, of coronavirus, uh, you know, shots for 5 to 11. So, I mean, the signaling is happening, you know, truly from the top down and it's percolating from, from the federal level to the state level, you know, to the county level, to the, to the school board level. So these things are happening. And so I agree with that assessment. Um, I think maybe Lori said it or John first said it, we've got to get ready and get, folk get ready mentally, get ready organizationally. And then Craig just, you know, uh, offered up some synthesis to that with his comments. Let's just, uh, you know, have uh, have Dr. Drotty and, and the team be prepared uh, when uh, when these things move forward, because it's 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 the, it's moving in that direction. That's the momentum. And that's where things are going. 
Can I just say something? I, know, I, I, just, I agree with that. I mean, one of the big, the key things is though, I don't think that we should be making a timeline and send that that by the first meeting in November, the second meeting in November, we have something ready. We have a lot of things to do. And right now we're, we're gonna have a special meeting on November 2nd for the purpose. I'd rather the superintendent get ready for our November 2nd meeting so that we can, can continue doing the education piece in this district. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll take it as it is. I mean, he can always update us in, at, at, you know, at, at every meeting if he wants regarding what the latest is. But I don't think we're gonna see much action and I hate to be pushing and putting more on the superintendent. We have a, a lot of other things to do on, and, and everybody thinks about education. Well, the whole evening tonight, look at what we spent doing tonight. And to be honest with you, people are gonna have various views about this or that. And you know, those everybody has their own personal views on this. So all I could say is that I think Dr. Drotty has an understanding that we can move forward with it comes, but we don't have to push it that we have to have something, a, you know, a resolution ready by the 17th of November. I think we, it, it'll come, I think it'll come. And I don't think it'll come easier as we give it more time. So all the rest of the, you know, the legislature or, where it, or the governors, you know, a lot of the things get, you know, get resolved before we even move on it. So anyway. And I just, I just wanna add one more thing. So I think, well, I think, uh, it's not inconsistent with what Maria said that Dr. Drotty should work with staff, lawyers, whoever to prepare something for either the second meeting in November or maybe even it's the first meeting in December. Maybe there is only one meeting in December. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> and that really has to do with the fact that I think everybody, even those who aren't comfortable with this, want to tie something to the lifting whatever however we say it permanent authorization of the 12 to 18 um and to allow for what does or doesn't happen um with the fda but the one thing i wanted to caution about was this i really do think it's important um that we remember that there is such a thing as the brown act people are always accusing us wrongfully i think of violating it i don't want us to violate it by trying to put this together in private, we can't. It would be easier, but we can't. So yes, Dr. Drotty can talk to each individual and make sure he heard what he heard and all of that. But really what we said is what has to form the basis for what the staff actions that occur are. He, it, it, it can't be direction that he go figure out what it is everybody wants and how it just can't, we can't operate that way. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the one other thing, I hate to even bring this up, but I do think that the one thing we're gonna get stuck on is the governor approach includes a personal exemption. And so even if the California Department of Public Health acts, I believe they will act pursuant to um, what, the governor said, which includes the personal exemption. And again, the person the it is in that language, which again, I'm gonna have Sarah send to everybody about what other districts have done and encouraging local districts to do what they need to do. So it may be that that's a nuance that, you know, I, but it, it, and fly in the ointment, I just kind of want to put it out there because it is out there. It's gonna be out there one way or another. <laughs> can, can, can I? Um, right. to not the personal exemption, but the earlier part. I, in my mind, what we're asking the superintendent to do is really administrative logistical rather than board preference. And he'll bring back staff recommendation that given my understanding that the majority of the board will probably wanna move forward once a permanent approval is given, here's the timeline I need to know and here's how long I can get it done in. And this is what I would suggest the resolution say to empower me to do what we need to do. And then it can come back to the board and folks can do things to it in public, not violating the Brown Act for political board member purposes. But what I was suggesting is just let Ben do his thing on, you know, on the implementation of what sounds like 
what the majority of the board is going to want to do. And, and just leave it out, leave it off the public eye, leave it out of the board's attention. Let's get back to working on day-to-day education. Let's work on mental health. Let's give ourselves a mental health timeout on this subject. Because also, who knows what's going to come up between now and then that might move this in a whole whole other direction, too. Right. Right. I mean, one of my... So, Craig, before, before I get forget... Before I forget, so basically, if I'm hearing you, which I which I, I think I agree with, so we were asking Dr. Drotti to prepare for that moment. If it comes by November 18th, we will bring it up on November 18th. If it hasn't happened yet, we will not bring it up until it happened, but he will be ready for that eventuality because the action will have been taken that mitigates the response. I mean, that, 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 that causes the response. Yeah, great. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that is the best way to go without continuing to belabor these conversations. I do think it's important that our, our discussions on COVID are vital to educational outcomes in our district. So while these are not talking about stuff that we love to talk about, they're very important with the continuing success of our kids during an unprecedented time. Um, wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna keep moving us on then. To an inf- there's one information item I wanna bring your attention to, a request for supplementary, supplementary materials. We have one general public comment by Wendy Dembo, who will have three minutes to address the board. She signed up at 10.08. I mean, it's it's legit. Yeah, so uh, Wendy, if you're here, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello. I would like to just state that um, I have been speaking with other people who are very concerned about what's happening on the board and they think that you should make, and I agree, that you should make a mandate that if a person is running for the SMM USD board and they have a child of school age, they should be attending the Santa Monica Malibu schools. I just find it shocking that we only have one board member on the board with a student in school. I think it's very important for parents to be able, board members who are parents to know what is going on in the schools and the experiences that the school, that the kids are having as a board member. So I just like to state that. And thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Um, Are there any board member items? I have no request by members of the public uh, or district advisory committee. Um, uh, No continuation of public comment. We did them all. Any board member comments? Seeing none, I will ask for an adjournment. Jen says yes, and Lori agrees, and everybody, thank you all for your work tonight. We will see you at our next meeting on November 4th.